do you pass up the opportunity to spit blood in Joan Baez's face? Face, face, face. <laughs> I inverted an epiglottis. Let's round up a faceless and get some pajamas. Dude, I didn't know my head was a bank. That's fucking awesome. I want to eat so many Tootsie Rolls, I just shit a tire. I jerked off with this towel so much, it might be a surfboard. Mr. Schmidt is an entertainer, not a cool. Hey, what's happening, Mike Schmidt? 40-year-old boy podcast. You know what, folks? I've been thinking. That's right. It's, it's a dangerous time when Mike's doing some thinking. It's even a more dangerous time when Mike refers to himself in the third person. Not only that, twice in the first five seconds of the goddamn podcast. Dude, just be you. You don't have to say yourself and call your hi. I mean, I'll say sometimes, hi, I'm Mike, which means, again, I'm presenting myself to you. But to call myself Mike, ah, what? that's a douchebag move. That's dangerous. You can't start referring to yourself in the third person because then all of a sudden you're some fucking self-important dickwad. And if you were self-important dickwad, you wouldn't have a goddamn podcast. You'd be on a television show of some repute. Uh, you'd be on a, a radio show or something. You'd be consumed in mass media. You wouldn't be uh, off in the ghetto of podcasts if you could refer to yourself in the third person. Any, let, Let's go ahead and say it. Any podcaster who re- refers to himself in the third person doesn't immediately catch himself on it uh, and bust himself like I'm doing here in the first minute of the show. If there's anybody out there who really calls themselves by their own name and refers to themselves in the third person, uh, unsubscribe to that podcast. You know, not even that. Your, your, your iPod's been sullied. Throw it into the ocean. That's what I say. Uh, Pacific, Indian, Atlantic, your choice. Uh, there's, I think it's only, there's only three of them, right? Throw it into the Dead Sea. Isn't there a Dead Sea? Oh, that'd be like the new Dead Sea Scroll when people dig it up in 10,000 years and they're like, what are all of these machines that are in here? I think those were the babies of a Steve Jobs, if we remember correctly. Remember him? He was played by Ashton Kutcher in a movie. Do you think in 10,000 years they'll know that Ashton Kutcher played Stephen Jobs in a movie? By the way, there's a very good chance that Ashton Kutcher did not play Stephen Jobs in a movie because I have found out that my brain is not working properly. Last week I said it was sem- uh, Pavement did a song and it was sem- Sonic, and uh, and you know what the best part about this show is, by the way, it's a comedy show. I do a two and a half hour comedy show last week, and uh, does anybody write me to tell me it's funny? No. Does anybody go ahead and say, oh man, it was a great show this week? No. Uh, people all of a sudden write me and they go, hey, you, uh, you, you missed that band in hour two of your extemporaneous comedy show. Really? Well, I'm going to go jump off a fucking cliff, because obviously you listened and politely with your hands crossed, and I'm not saying every moment of this fucking thing is funny, uh, but it would be nice if someone prefaces it with, hey, Mike, great show this week. By the way, you fucked everything up. I mean, you know, hit me, be nice to me. Jerk me off a little bit before you punch me in the stomach. You know, I, I'll take a shot at the breadbasket. I'm not your Houdini. I'm not going to die from that kind of thing. Uh, but if you punch me right in the old uh, sternum, right in the old, uh, what's that? What the hell is that thing in the middle? Of, right beneath your breastbone. What the, well, the breadbasket is certainly all of that. Uh, your 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 exhale hole. I don't I don't know what the fuck it is. You know, because there used to be a trick. Like, I, I, here's the thing I used to do when I was a young man, because this is what happens when you're uh, foolish. Um... In addition to my chugging abilities, uh, I used to do this thing where, like, anybody could punch me in the stomach. I was like, oh, yeah, you can hit me in the stomach. But, that, but the chugging abilities came later. The punching in the stomach was, that was clearly a junior high extravaganza. That was not a high school thing. I had advanced out of punching me in the stomach by high school. Even though I was only 13, I still knew that getting punched in the stomach, probably not cool. And also, I think that maybe people, by the time we got into high school, I think I was wise to the fact that eventually uh, I was going to run into somebody who actually knew how to throw a punch. And uh, they would punch me directly into the fucking uh, Widowmaker, and I would just cough up my fucking liver. And everybody would be like, ha ha, you're even less cool now than you were when you were walking down the hallway with your t-shirt on and your mirrored shades. Oh, I've told that story in here many times. That was uh, freshman year for me, friends. Carrying a giant boombox playing Highway to Hell on my shoulder. Mirrored shades, sunglasses on my way to the uh, the math pod. <laughs> Why? Do you ever look back? I'll tell you this, too. Uh, I've recently delved into, because I told you as I was, I was fixing my house. Uh, hey, I didn't even tell you what there was a small chance of. I'll get to that in just a second. As I was doing the house here, which I'll get to also in a few seconds, a few minutes. Look, folks, stick around. Settle in. We'll get to it at some point. Uh, and eventually I'll fuck something up, and then you'll be able to run to your keyboard and type it out and go, Hey, Mike, you fucked that up. Yes, I know I did. Okay, I already fucked up the Kutcher Jobs thing. I'm sure I fucked up a million other goddamn things. It wasn't just, weren't there like nine Steve Jobs movies that came out? He was played by like Ashton Kutcher and fucking uh, Michael Fassbender, I think, and Bob Euchre and all these other motherfuckers. Yes, I know it wasn't Bob Euchre. I threw that in for fun for you guys. You know why? Because a lot of you are listening to this show in the front row. <laughs> That's what the Uke does. Uh, the Uke of America. What if, it, what if it was that instead of the Youth of America? Everybody's like, ah, you know what? We must listen to the Youth of America. Instead, what if we listen to the Uke of America? 
And, uh, and he just went ahead and said, just a bit outside. And that's how we handle our politics and our lives. You know what? I live by the Uke of America <laughs> slogan, mandate, whatever the fuck you want to call it. And I live my life just a bit outside. You know what? That's a T-shirt. Let's fucking print that up. As you've noticed, uh, we, we don't have any new T-shirts yet. I'm always looking for ideas. I'm always churning them out on this show. Uh, and don't think uh, I wasn't talking about punching a guy in the Widowmaker. Uh, you know what? I need a T-shirt with a, with a thing like abs, fake abs, and so you can start doing the punching me in the stomach thing again. That's what I'll do. I'll, I'll, we need a T-shirt that you can slide a cookie sheet into. Like when uh, Batman fucking M- Michael Keaton put that silver tray in his jacket and the Joker shot him in the heart and he lived. How does that happen, really? Tim Burton... You know, I, if I meet Tim Burton, first I'm going to shake his hand. Well, you know what? This is a lie. I met Tim Burton. I, why, am I, why am I saying if I meet Tim Burton? I fucking met that guy. We went to a book signing when he had the melancholy death or whatever, Life of Oyster Boy. He, he made like a little hard car, a carver, hard carver. Uh, he had a hard carver. He created a knife. He actually has a whole kitchen knife set. I, I, I'll tell you what. I don't saw open a bagel unless it's, unless it's with a Burton hard carver. That's when I do it. Remember Burton hard carver? He, stood in, he started uh, Highway Patrol with fucking Broderick Crawford. Him and Burton hard carver. Um, but yeah, me and Karen waited in line for, what, a month to fucking meet Tim Burton? And and just, he, you, know what, you know what Tim Burton looks like in person? He looks like Mike Toomey if someone had scared him badly because his hair just like rockets. He's got that crazy hair. Like the, the, that's, the, well, that's Tim Burton. Look, he's esoteric, folks. He's an artist, as you know, as indicated by the melancholy death of Oyster Boy, which was signed and autographed for my ex-wife by uh, Tim Burton as we waited in line, and he was very pleasant to both of us. He was lovely, and he responded very well to our compliments. Uh, he did not respond very well to our criticism. <laughs> what if I did that? What if I dropped that on him? I got it. Mr. Burton, I have a bone to pick with you, sir. In 1989's Batman, which I was very excited to see, uh, there is a scene where the Joker invades uh, Vicky Vale's apartment complex. There's a, there's a Michael Keaton playing a wild-eyed Bruce Wayne, and he figures the only way to get out of this is to scare said Joker, played by a Messer Jack Nicholson. Why would I be doing it like that? I don't know if I would. Uh, but yeah, I should have criticized him. I should have said to him, hey, dude, what the fuck? Why would, why would Michael Keaton get shot in the heart and live? Like, how could, I mean, if he, had, look, if he had his bat played in or some bullshit like that, I could totally get it. But he pulled out literally like a silver serving tray, like a cookie sheet, like a tea service, and that stopped a bullet from the Joker. Now, granted, this wasn't the Joker's fucking eight-foot barrel, uh, or four-foot barrel. It's probably four-foot, right? Because he had it tucked into his pants. The Joker wasn't 15 feet tall. It was only as long as his leg. It was only as long as his leg. It was only as long as, only as long as, only as long as his leg. Uh, I enjoyed the cadence of that. That sounded fun. It sounded like a little sing-songy. I enjoyed bringing you that sing-song. It was only as long as his leg. It was only as long as his leg. Uh, when the Joker pulls out that giant gun and then he shoots Batman's jet down with it. And uh, again, a- another problem. There's a lot of problems in that fucking movie. Again, I want to revisit it because I think maybe I'm going to like it still. Except for the fact that Batman can't turn his head ever. That's always a problem, too. When Batman hears a noise and he's startled and he literally has to turn his entire body in 180 degree fashion instead of able to be able to glance behind him. Look, Batman's a fucking ninja. He should be able to have uh, all sorts of like eyes in the back of his head and wheeling and spinning around and stuff. Uh, you know, but that cowl, that was a problem. Because you can actually see it's bolted to the fucking body, to the suit. Um, and I like the fact that in, you know, when, they, when they had the bail Batman, they dealt with the fact that like Alfred is like, all right, these are in pieces and we got to put you together and they got to stitch Batman up or whatever the fuck. But in the old Batman show, because you think Michael Go or Gao or whatever the fuck that guy was, you think he's helping Batman? Because that Alfred, I mean, like, Michael Caine alone, it's tough to swallow Michael Caine, because, again, he was 8,000 fucking years old. So is he really helping Batman out of jams? Or putting him in a suit? Or able to stitch him up? Or whatever the fuck? Do anything other than bring him creme brulee in the Batcave and go, Sir, you shouldn't do this. Well, some men just want to watch the world burn. Shouldn't, shouldn't be out there shooting these criminals. Criminals. Don't punch these criminals, Batman. Chris Bale. Uh, all right. Uh... <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't know if you've been here all ten years. I don't know if you're new. Uh, you're probably not around if you're new. You bailed probably at minute four, going, "What the fuck is this guy doing?" And is he ever going to tell us the thing that he was going to tell us in the beginning of the show? I'm here to tell you this. No, I'm probably not. Uh, but yeah, that Batman movie, man. Batman gets shot and lives. Uh, Vicky Vale, of course, we all know Vicky Vale in the Batcave. That's that's a monstrous blow to the to the to the canon. There was no doubt that Vicky Vale should not be allowed into the Batcave. And Alfred immediately, he's the one who lets her in. Almost, because almost like, because then Alfred was like a dick. He was like, Batman, you need to stop being Batman. Master, Master Bruce, please stop being a vigilante crime fighter and just stick to eating caviar and let me give you fucking foot rubs. That was what that Alfred was all about. But then you get Michael Caine, who's, you know, fucking old, old school scrapper from the Cockney. He's, he's never seen without his uh, Burton hardcarver. He's, he's never, he's got that right in his pocket, ready for a scrap to break out. 
And uh, and he's just like, wow, Massa Wayne, how you doing? I can't do Michael Caine, and I don't even know why I'm objecting or uh, uh, objecting you to it again. That that was the proper word. I'm objecting you to a second attempt at Michael Caine, <laughs> even though the first one was so bad. Some men just want to watch about Bane. I can't, that's that's more of a Cary Grant. Jody, Jody, Jody. Uh, he never said that, by the way, in any movie, if I remember correctly. I don't know. Again, the robots from the future who find these in the Dead Sea when you start unearthing this particular show, and then you run to whatever you guys have for Google or Wikipedia ten thousand years from now and you're like Cary Grant Judy 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 did he ever say it uh, what if that was the one thing they took from this show from the whole 11 year run when aliens like the guys at the end of AI who found fucking uh, uh, who's the kid from Sixth Sense god I can't remember his name it's like he's got three names like Edward Edward, Edward, Edward Everett Horton no um how come I can't pull that name? I'm the oldest man alive now. Look what the fuck just happened to me. I, I, I literally went into the Sixth Sense mode. There's Bruce Willis. There's the uh, the wife person. And then there's the fucking the scared kid. Oh, I can't believe I can't remember that fucking kid's name. And you know what? I, all I want to do is talk in circles until I remember that fucking kid's name. That's it. I just want Because I can't stop down. If I stop down, I lose momentum. Because I could just IMDB this fucking kid and go, oh, well, there he is. Maybe I could just grab my phone and do it too. But that would be cheating. I want to go ahead and pull this kid's name out. Sean William Scott. No, that's Stifler. He's not the scared guy. But you know what? That's not a bad idea. What if the Sixth Sense is remade and they make Sean William Scott the fucking kid? What if you do that? He sees dead people, but he's in a dumb Stifler voice or whatever the fuck. Or he's, it's the Stifler from Goon. Or the Sean William Scott from Goon. I guess he wasn't Stifler in Goon. Yeah, technically he was. He was Stifler who played hockey. You ever see Goon with Jay Baruchel and Sean William Scott? God damn, that's a great show. Um, they don't. I will tell you, this, they do not see dead people, but they do. They play a lot of hockey and they swear a lot and they make a lot of jokes. Now I'll tell you what. I understand that there's a Goon too. Um, look, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna shit on a Jay Baruchel. You want to make a second Goon? Go ahead, Sean William Scott. I don't know what else you got going on in your life, sir. If you want to go ahead and step back into the skates and make a Goon too, because you think you can improve on Goon one or at least carry on the legacy. That's fine for both of you guys, but I just don't ask me to sit the Ragoon too. It's not you, yeah, yeah. I gave you a lot of goodwill in watching Goon One, and you pleasantly surprised me. But I gotta admit, you didn't bank any other credit to go forward. There's no goodwill in me for Goon Two. Not happening. Um, unless, but like as Gio always says, he's like, you gotta find these movies you haven't seen, and then you can review them on YouTube, and people will watch and they'll donate. I'm like, nobody's gonna donate to hear what I think about Goon, especially when I'm giving it away for free right here on the goddamn show. I'm the worst whore in the business. I'm the worst prostitute you've ever seen. I lay down right here on the show, put the microphone by between my legs, and talk about Goon 2 for free. What the fuck, man? Uh, why am I the one getting laid? And that's it. Oh, I guess, yeah, prostitutes get laid, right? Don't they? Or do they just suck off? They probably just blow dudes. No, prostitutes get, they fuck too, right? Do prostitutes fuck? I wouldn't know. How could you fuck a prostitute? That just seems like fucking, that's bad news all the way. Because you always hear those stories where they pick them up in the car and then they pull around the corner and they bang them in an alley of the fucking car. Do you know how rough car sex is? Now you're paying for the fucking privilege? So some chick's got her stack heels hanging out the fucking window and you're fucking steaming up windows with prostitute breath? Because they've been in the street, you know, because look, how many guys have they sucked off before they get into your car? So now your, your windows, your car's just going to smell like cock forever because they just steamed up your window with cock breath. And and sure, you're you're banging them. And I mean, I guess you got to you gotta go reverse cowgirl because you're not going to fucking get on top. No one's going to go missionary with a fucking prostitute in the backseat of the car because that's hard enough with the girl you're dating in high school. But then you fucking spin it around. I guess she puts one leg out the window. Um, and then another leg up on your shoulder and you got to work her that way, which is fine, I suppose. And look, I, I got to be honest with you. Um, I guarantee the prostitute is more limber than the Chinese acrobat in uh, Ocean's 10 or whatever the fuck, Ocean's 11. <laughs> Why did I make a prequel? <laughs> Because that was the poor, that was the poor parody of Ocean's Eleven, and it was Danny Ocean had a ten-inch cock, so they made Ocean's Ten. But then he banged a bunch of prostitutes that were all Chinese acrobats that came in boxes delivered to his goddamn house. And by the way, also in that, Danny Ocean also came in a box. <laughs> Come on, little cream pie humor for all of us. We love that, right? Don't we? We do. Um, well, I don't know why I made a prequel. I couldn't think of Ocean's Eleven. I still can't even think of the name of the fucking kid from Sixth Sense. This whole thing's falling apart, man. This is year 11. I'm 51 years old. You know, when it was year one, I was 40. I was fucking bang, bang, bang. I had the references. I had the people. I knew what was what. I could pull names and everything. And now I've got 14 Steve Jobs movies in my brain. And I don't know who the fuck played them. And I'm worried about the aliens from AI, which, by the way, also featured the kid from Sixth Sense. And I still can't remember his fucking name. Uh, oh, I guess that's why I initially talked about him, right? Didn't I initially bring it up because I said the kid from Sixth Sense and then segue into, into fucking AI? I don't know. Dude, folks, I have no idea what the fuck is happening on this show. It's just me talking a lot. That's all that's happening. So again, as I've said, if you listen to the first 10 years of the show, you're used to this. This is what happens. We just wind up in the fucking hamster wheel and spin it over and over and over until I get tossed out into a pile of sawdust and pass out in my own fucking spit and word vomit. Uh, however, if you're new... Welcome aboard. Brace yourself because it's this. You know, go familiarize yourself. If I can recommend a year to you folks, it would 
probably be year six uh, because that's the one that people always wrote me. Hey, I'm in, I'm in year six. And I get it. It's because a lot of people are like, hey, man, year six is when you went off the fucking rails. And I'm like, man, I get that possibly uh, because people root against what, you know, whatever. And also I said, was uh, year six is when I was, I tried to be happy for a while and that didn't work out very well with this show. I mean, I was real happy for a while until all of a sudden I went, oh, oh this is all fake. Um, which is fun. But then, you know, I'll tell you what, here's what I recommend. When you wind up in a situation that might be fake, by all means, extend the life of that situation by a couple of years and still fake it for everybody. So they think that it's going well. That's what I would recommend to you guys. I would, uh, you know, take, take solace in all of the tiny little moments that are good. Uh, and then, and then pay attention to the huge, huge, huge swaths of time that are, uh, that you have to cover up for by going, look at this smiley photo. <laughs> Uh, Christ. All right. So, so if you're new, man, also, if you're new, like I said, go listen to year six, you know, that'll explain itself probably, or, or go listen to one of the interludes from two years ago. And there's songs that'll fucking explain everything there. Um, but I should have talked to Tim Burton. You know, I did meet him. Like I said, Karen got Oyster Boy signed and I was right there. I had my opportunity to ask him all these questions. Why does the Joker use a small gun and a big gun? Why does his small gun not kill Bruce Wayne when he shoots him directly in the heart? But his long barreled gun brings down the bat jet. I mean, how the fuck does that happen? Uh, and also Vicky Vale in the back here, which we all know is a huge tra- transgression. And then why is old Alfred there? Old Alfred's not helping anybody. And uh, it's just, it was just grim. And then, although it's got, it's still, hey, Vinny, it's your Uncle Bingo, time to pay the check. Still top five lines in any Batman movie, as far as I'm concerned. Hey, Vinny, it's your Uncle Bingo, time to pay the check. And then he kills a guy with a pen. The fucking Joker killed a guy with a pen in that show. Just threw it right into his goddamn throat, right in the old jugular. Uh, I tell you what, the old pen to the jugular, you don't get that enough. But I'll tell you this, let me ask you this, do you think Christopher Nolan was making a direct linear connection with that movie when he had the Joker kill a guy with a pencil in Dark Knight? Perhaps, because in the first Batman, 1989, the Joker kills a guy with a pen, and then you go over to Dark Knight and the Joker kills a guy with a pencil. Now I'm going to ask you this, and again, just because we're suspending disbelief, I love Dark Knight, I will tell you this, in August... Let me throw this out to anybody in Los Angeles. Any of you fine people are out there. Uh, you know it's coming back out. It'll be out for a week to celebrate the 10-year anniversary of the movie. They're releasing it at, uh, in IMAX for a week in August, certainly here in Los Angeles and other large urban centers around the universe. Uh, that seems like extended coverage, probably just in America. I don't think it's a universal release. Uh, i tell you what, on Neptune, those people are going to really love to see The Dark Knight in IMAX. It's not like they can walk outside and go, hey, we're on fucking Neptune, man. Which, by the way, to them is just Earth. Like, I mean, to, for us, like, whenever you hear that story, like I said, when John Glenn's like, hey, I was on the fucking moon, dude. I think I mentioned that last week even. I don't know that's in my fucking brain. And everybody here is, like, impressed. But, like, if you're on the moon and you're like, hey, dude, I was on the fucking moon, you're just like, nah, so what? It's fucking Earth. Who cares? I mean, that's big shit. Uh, I mean, if some if fucking aliens come down here. Then later on, they go back to Neptune. They're like, yeah, oh, yeah, buddy. I, you know, they're at a cocktail party there, and they got their antennas dipped in fucking alien vodka or whatever the fuck they drink up there. And the dude's like, hey, I was on Earth. <laughs> Although, is that as impressive as Neptune? I don't know. One of these planets is a ball of ice, and, uh, and which would be good for us right now. If you merge Neptune and Earth, that would be fantastic, because with our global warming and Neptune's ball of isitude, you would have a nice climate. You, you know what? If you, if you put Neptune and Earth together, you know what you get? Maine in the fall. That's lovely, right? Don't you think? It's just a nice 65 degrees with leaves changing. Now, granted, we have to live with the Neptunians at that point, and that's no fun for anybody because they dare just jag off. They're uh, the people from Neptune. Because, you know, you think I'm uh, annoying you with questions about Batman. You should hear the questions the Neptunians have. Holy shit. They want to know about Dark Knight. They got all these. Uh, you know, you talk to a Neptune guy, and the next thing you know, you're dealing about, well, why was Batman in Hong Kong? Well, because he went to fucking Hong Kong. Well, how did he get there? I don't know. And then you got to talk about Batman Rises or whatever the Dark Knight Rises. And, and look, I've got my own questions you know so I'm, I'm with the neptunians on that like i said how does batman not get raped in that movie you gotta rape christian bale you gotta rape he's a pretty guy he shows up in the jail he can't he's got a broken back this dude is the hey you do you, have you ever heard of any prison at all any especially in the fucking darkest whatever europe or chechnya or whatever the fuck they are and they're like hey do you see that new american with the broken back over uh, in in fucking cell four Dude, you wouldn't be able to see him because there'd be a line down the hallway for rape privileges. I mean, the new American dude with the broken back would just be getting worked all the time. I don't give a fuck what wise old blind sage decided to protect him. Uh, I don't care if Raz al Ghul came in and said, hey, nobody rapes the new guy. I mean, they'd be like, fuck you. They'd rape Raz al Ghul, too. There's, they'd overwhelm him. There'd be so many guys that would just steamroll into the goddamn uh, cell and totally rape all of them. I, you know what? You would have to have at least six guys from Batman's rogues gallery to fight off a gang of Chechenian rapists. That's what I'm going to say. If you've got... You'd have to have Batman, certainly, but he's got a broken back, so he's wounded. Ray Zal Ghul is, is awesome. I love him. But still, again, that's only two and a fucking thousand. Um, 
But I, see, I was just going to name like Riddler and Joker and those dudes. Like, but they're not. They would join in the raping. I mean, I was, well, I don't know if the Riddler would. I don't, Riddler doesn't seem like a rapist. Joker seems like the kind of guy who would rape him just to, like I said, to take pictures of it and make it funny. Like in the Killing Joke, when he clearly, clearly, let's get over this right now. Clearly, the Joker raped Barbara Gordon in that, and he took photos of it. There was no doubt about it. He did terrible, terrible things to Barbara Gordon. And then, uh, but in the book, they cleaned it up a little bit. They're just like, oh, look, he just took pictures of her. He took nude pictures of her with a gunshot. But it's the Joker, man. He knows. He wants to really psychologically. Break break fucking Gordon, and honestly, you're going to psychologically break Barbara Gordon at that fucking point, because if she wakes up eventually, you know, yeah, I can't walk, but also at the same time, holy shit, I got railed by the Joker. That's no fun. And then what if the Joker fucking, what if he gave her a Joker baby? Ah, that's awful. You didn't think about that, did you? You think the Joker uses protection? That's a bad dude. He shot Barbara Gordon in the hip, took her clothes off. Let me ask you this. All right, let's talk about this. Why not? Because I'm alone and I got nobody to stop me, and I recognize clearly that this is not a topic I should be talking about and not a road I should be going down, and yet here we are. But if the Joker shoots Barbara Gordon and then he takes all of her clothes off and then he uh, takes photos of her while she's incapacitated and he pr- fucking paralyzes her. Uh, and then uh, you, you got to figure the Joker's going to make that next leap. And he's like, I'm going to have sex with Barbara Gordon because why not? We're here. I'm wearing a Hawaiian shirt. I've got a camera and we're going to drive her dad crazy. This is the next step in my evil plan. There's no way. Let's be honest, the Joker's going to put a condom on for that act. It's not going to happen. The only way the Joker wears the condom to rape Barbara Gordon is if he thinks it's that much funnier because he goes, all right, well, if he makes the joke of like, well, you know what, I'm going to do this. However, uh, out of respect for you and your father, I'm going to head and wear, I'm going to use protection, of course, because I don't know where Barbara's been. Like, that would be even worse to do, I guess. So, you know what, I wouldn't put it past the Joker to wear protection if he raped Barbara Gordon just because of the joke factor of him being able to go, well, I don't know where Barbara's been. That makes a lot of sense. Um... It probably says a lot about me that I could think of these terrible things that the Joker would have done and then that should have, not should have done, but I think that he did do. Like, I, because as we know, like I said, I think that Superman should have been raped. There's no doubt Superman should have been raped in that one movie uh, where he came back. It was, I think it was also Superman Returns. A lot of these guys are returning. I love Batman Returns, Superman Returns. I might have a Wonder Woman returning eventually. Aquaman is coming back. He's going to come out. And I, have you seen Look, we've all seen the trailer for Aquaman. Did I talk about this yet? I, ho- I don't know if I did or I didn't. Uh, look, folks, I you like Aquaman. And that's fantastic. I hope you're all excited for him. And I like that guy. Uh, James Wan, I think, has made some... Isn't he the Saw guy? Or he makes some decent movies. Um, and then also, he made... He didn't make Paranormal Activity, but he made The Conjuring, maybe. I don't know. He's one of those dudes. But he's a very competent director. Certainly, he makes amazing fucking films. Good for him. And people love him. And they like the work that he does. And uh, Jason Momoa. Uh, who looks basically like the White Rock. I mean, that dude is in there, and he's Aquaman, and good for him. But uh, but did you see the trailer and think to yourself, hey, this looks mighty familiar, T'Challa. This this looks mighty familiar, Underwater Black Panther. Uh, because that's all the, the trailer. I lit- I mean, I in my I just watched it and went, this is... This is Black Panther. Like, it wasn't even a joke. It was like, this is Black Panther. Except they they put in a little head. It wouldn't be DC if I didn't have to meet the parents of the people involved. Holy fuck. Maybe that's why I love Spider-Man so much. Because I don't know who his fucking mom and dad are, and I don't care. I know there's Aunt May. I know there's Uncle Ben. I know Spider-Man is, is Spider-Man because of fucking Uncle Ben. I get all that. It's the same fucking thing every single time. Uh, protect your parents, folks. Just protect them, because otherwise you're going to wind up in a cape running around punching dudes in the face. That's the only thing I can tell you. Make sure if your parents live a long life, uh, you will have an unremarkable crime-fighting career. However, if something tragic happens to your parents, look out, motherfucker. You're going to come down in a spaceship and throw a guy through 13 buildings. It's going to fucking happen, man. That's the way it works. Uh, And it's frustrating. I will not lie to you. It is absolutely frustrating to see the, the Aquaman trailer. And again, I don't... I don't need to meet his parents. I don't need to hear have him go, oh, I, my my dad ran a lighthouse and my mom was, I guess, Nicole Kidman, somebody said. I found her unrecognizable because she was wearing some sort of Aquaman mom death mask. Uh, but I mean, look, she survived Scientology, so fuck it. Nicole Kidman can do whatever the fuck she wants. And, you know, I'll tell you, what else did I, I, I need to, I'll, let's throw this out here too. Uh, so I apologize to Nicole Kidman. I was just teasing. I didn't think you have a death mask on. I'm just, I mean, not that she's listening, and but not that any of you have some direct connection to Nicole, like I said. Some of you may be Scientologists. I don't even know. Here's my favorite part about Scientologists. Let's talk about this for just a second. Scientologists, of course, they've got Tom Cruise, and then they're kidnapping everybody else, John Travolta and whoever the fuck, the Rabisi family, the entire Rabisi family is there. And, uh, and then they had Nicole Kidman was there, of course, because she was Tom Cruise's guy. She signed a contract and whatever the fuck and she was in a uh, yeah I, she was on his arm at events and then she gave him a couple of babies and and then she went you know what i am done with this cult and my contract has run out so now i'm gonna go have sex with a country singer that looks like a lady 
Uh, because she went as far away from Tom Cruise as she possibly could with this weird intensity and motorcycle stunts. She said, I'm going to go find Keith Urban because he has the jawline of a 56-year-old lady and the guitar skills that I always admired in a man. Because uh, I can't picture Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise is the kind of guy, like, he's he's like, hey, man, let's buy a helicopter into a fucking volcano. But if you said to him, would you like to learn to play piano, Tom? He'd go, nah, that takes fucking forever. Can you download it in my head like the Matrix? And he'd be like, no. And they'd be like, all right, well, then I'm going to go sit on the tallest building in the fucking world and eat a fucking ham sandwich. Uh, although it's got to be some genetic mutated Scientology ham, I'm sure, in some fashion, some way. Um, all right, before, I don't want to lose the plot. I was talking about Aquaman, but we're, we're venturing off into Scientology now because there are billboards now all across the United States, or at least in Los Angeles. Uh, if you don't know this, DirecTV, uh, who I detailed my uh, breakup with last week. By the way, they have not contacted me. They have not decided to find out if I needed to come back. They did not reach out and go, hey, man, let's make up. Nope. They sent me an email that said, your service has been disconnected. To return our equipment henceforth. Uh, to avoid being charged. And I'm like, oh, whatever the fuck. Yeah, great, being charged. So, uh, by the way, I haven't returned it yet. Jesus, that's not good. I got to go look at the date on that. I do not want to be charged. I'm leaving this week. Uh, I'm going out of town. All right, so uh, Scientology, they, they have a direct TV. They have a Scientology channel. And I was talking to my good friend, Pat Francis, and he was like, uh, man, I want to quit DirecTV just because they got a fucking Scientology channel. Because Pat is a guy who, uh, you know, he, he goes ahead and he has a cause. And he's like, I don't want to be force-fed this Scientology garbage. And I feel the same way about all of it. I mean, I don't, I don't need your Jesus channel. I don't need your fucking Pat Robertson. I don't need your fucking Scientology channel. I don't need any channel. I need five channels. And all of them are people making fucking cakes. That's all I goddamn need with my life. But sure enough... They have the Scientology channel, so there are a lot of people fighting back against it. Well, now Scientology has gone ahead and put some of their high-powered loot behind their own ad campaign. And it says, uh, you've heard uh, the, tr- the rumors, now hear the truth. Tune in to Scientology channel 325 on DirecTV. And uh, th- that's ineffective. I'm going to tell you, that is a very ineffective ad campaign. Because um, there weren't a lot of rumors in the Leah Remini Scientology show. She basically dealt in fact because she was there. She saw a lot of it. She talked to a lot of people who fucking left there. And uh, they are armed and dangerous with a lot of facts about what went on behind the scenes. And I don't know if you're going to go ahead and tempt me to go, well, and who in their right mind is like, you know what? They're right. I got to see the truth behind Scientology. Nobody gives a fuck. Nobody gives a fuck about the, 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 the truth behind Jesus and the Bible. Nobody, it's like, although I guess, you know what, bullshit. I can't say nobody gives a fuck. I clearly don't give a fuck, and I don't think anybody else should. But the History Channel is always loaded. Again, it's the History Channel now. It's the History Channel, but it's always loaded with stuff now like, if Jesus arm wrestled Hitler, who would win? And then they spend an hour building it up, and at the end, they never get to the fucking conflict. But that's what, I guess, passes for history in our country anymore. I mean, it's just ridiculous. If the Nazis fought the dinosaurs, but they had to use technology from the the Romans. Who would win? Again, you know what? Bullshit. That's a good show. That's a show I watch. Instead, it's all this like the the history of the the, Luft, the Luftwaffe. You know what I mean? Or the, remember the Night of the Long Knives? This, wasn't that wistful? And then they have 14 fucking minutes of archival footage of guys in leather jackets with swastikas on their arms pointing at people in bars. I mean, come on, History Channel. Can't you find some real history to report on? But instead, you get fucking ancient aliens and the Ark and all this other bullshit. And what would happen if Jesus arrived today? Well, I, I can tell you what, as long as he didn't arrive here, because if he came here, they'd fucking put, he'd have a border that he'd be set over. Either He'd have to pick Canada or Mexico, because guess what? They all closed up at the inn. You thought they made you, you, you thought coming out of your fucking Mary's vagina in a barn was rough? Good luck coming to this country now, because this whole fucking country is just, is just literally going, hey man, sorry, no room at the inn. The United States Inn of America. You can go fucking back out to the barn, which, as you know, is either Canada or Mexico. Uh, but I've been to both. I've been to Canada. I've been to Mexico. Uh, my friend got stabbed near Mexico, so I'm going to say that Canada's a better place. I threw axes in Canada, but my friend was stabbed with a hot dog fork in uh, <laughs> a barbecue fork, hot dog fork in uh, in Tijuana. So uh, six of one, right? Half a dozen of the other, because I wasn't throwing the axes at anyone. Now here, I tell you what, let's let's combine that. Let me go to a uh, hot dog stand and have the guy stab my friend, and then let me throw axes at that dude. Now there you go. That's that. You know what I call that? Canada, Mexico. That's you combine those two countries, Manada. I, I combine I combine the two of them right there. I combine fucking America's hat and America's pants, and I go boom. There you go, Canexico, uh, which sounds like an oil company at this fucking point, doesn't it? Go to Canexico. You can trust us to make your car the best it's ever been. Uh, but Aquaman just looks like fucking Black Panther, right? I mean, it's just it's we got first we got to meet his parents again. He's in a lighthouse, and why a lighthouse? I mean, I, I get it because he's the sea, and they lived close to the sea because I, maybe the dad has fish powers. I I don't. She's a queen, or there's some who gives a fuck who cares i just i hate to be this guy i love marvel movies i don't care about dc movies but you know even with the marvel movies i don't i mean i know paul rudd is charming i haven't seen either ant-man yet 
just because he's fucking Ant-Man. Who the fuck cares about Ant-Man? He's an ant who's a or man or a man who's an ant. He gets as small like an ant, and then he gets big. Although he is responsible for the funniest line in the history of Marvel movies when Robert Downey Jr. sees him get big at the fight on the fucking tarmac, and he's just like, if anyone on our side has any heretofore unknown or shocking powers, if they could bring those to bear, I'm just like, man, that's my favorite fucking line in Marvel history. And by the way, yes, I know I didn't get the line right. You're going to look it up and give me the exact quote and go, you know what, Mike? Semisonic wrote that line when they did a punch-up on fucking Marvel's Infinity War, blah, blah, blah. Yes, please correct me all the time as I talk literally downhill without any fucking script at all. But I guess... I mean, fuck it. I can't be mad at you guys. You want to hold me to a higher standard? You got my, You want me to get shit right? And I get that. And I'd love to get shit right, except uh, it's more important for me to lay it down. It's more important for me to lay it... Important? It's more important for me to lay down a track, man. That's what I like to do. I lay down a goddamn track. I put it on wax. Uh, uh, Jason with an axe, but I put it on wax. And I give it to the suckers who thought I should relax. That's a that's a lot cool, Jay. Jason with an axe, but I put it on wax. Dedicated to the suckers who thought I should relax. Uh, that's a line that's trapped floating around in my goddamn head. But fuck, you know, Nicole Kidman is, I guess, like I said, she's the queen of the fish. And then he's the son. But, I mean, he's got, he can't be fully strong. He's got to be half man. Like, he's got his fish side, but then he's got dude side, right? And then... And what's he going to do in the ocean if he's half dude? Is that way he can breathe on land? I don't, I don't, I don't care. That's the thing. I don't care. I don't need to peel the Aquaman onion. It doesn't fucking matter to me. I don't fucking need to know what's going. I was going to say mean anything and matter. I said it doesn't matter to me. Uh, I just, but then, you know, but then he's got to fight his brother for the kingdom. I'm like, yes, I get it. I saw this in Black Panther. Oh, look, and heretofore undiscovered land of riches and wealth underneath a dome of invisibility. Well, that's underneath the ocean. That's, oh, look, is that Wakanda? No, it's, it's Aquanda. That's where he lives. He lives in Aquanda. And then he shows up and there's a, oh, look, there's a lady who loves him, even though he, she's never met him, but she's drawn in by his Nicole Kidman queenly fish side, but also his rugged manly side. And also, by the way, because he's fucking Jason Momoa, we all want to fuck Jason Momoa. And by, by the way, I, uh, pitching or catching for Momoa. What do I do? Um, I gotta, I mean, yeah, I don't want to do either really, but I mean, if you're going to pick one, you gotta, you, you want either way you're, it's gotta be missionary, right? So you look in his eyes. I don't know. I'm thinking, I've already thought now far too much about banging Jason Momoa in that sentence alone. I've gone ahead and just thought far too much as I should. Um, but the woman underneath the sea loves him, even though he's been raised in a lighthouse and, uh, you know, and, and brooding in his room. Are we going to get, is it going to be like, it should be like. You know, again, they made the Gotham show and it's young Bruce Wayne because we're always like nobody cares about young Bruce Wayne. But I guess we kind of do. But I mean, it's like there's that running joke about nobody saw Jesus from the time he was fucking, you know, a baby to the time he was 33. And what kind of a jag off was he? But like, what, what did baby Aquaman do? Did he just hang around the fucking lighthouse and wonder why he wanted to fuck fish? That's the only thing I can think of with him, right? He just he didn't have. And he's super mega. But I guess in the in the trailer, he saves a, another he saves another school bus and and. It's, it's the same shit like, or, or no, he doesn't have a school bus. Am I confusing that with the Superman trailer? I might have because I just watched them both at the same time. Um, but there's a Superman trailer where Clark Kent saves the fucking school bus. Everybody's like, oh, we saw what Clark did. But I think, I, did Aquaman do that too? Did he did he talk to a piranha once? And everybody's like, we totally saw you talking to that piranha. He's like, aha, no, I'm the lighthouse guy. And then he goes home and Nicole Kidman makes him fish sticks ironically, uh, even though they're vegan fish sticks. And he's like, mom. I mean, he's got to be a bad teenager, Aquaman, right? Uh, and then, wasn't there an Aqua Teen? Uh, well, there's Aqua Teen Hunger Force, certainly. Uh, my name is Sheikh Zula, the Mike Ruler. Um <laughs> fucking Master Shake. What if Aquaman fought Master Shake? I'd be on board. Oh, there's an Aqua Lad, right? Isn't that who it is? Uh, there's Aqua. It's not Aqua Teen. There's Aqua Lad. And, I, and here's the thing: I don't. I don't know anything about the fucking DC mythology. I don't know who these people are or who they purport to be. I don't know who they claim to be. But uh, but I, I is Aqua Lad like Aquaman's son? Did he did he fuck a, a real woman or a fish? And then they had an Aqua baby. And uh, and also I will tell you this. Uh, I guess he gets to be in the legacy suit, which is another thing that made me laugh. These guys are like, oh, man, the Aquaman trailer at Comic-Con was better than the one online because we get to see that Aquaman's in the legacy suit. And I, I don't, just that sentence alone. I, I mean, look, I finally saw what it was. Okay, I figured in my brain, I figured I knew what the legacy suit was. And, of course, the legacy suit was uh, him in the orange top with the green bottoms. You know what I mean? So, and that's that's the Aquaman I remember. That's the Aquaman I totally remember from fucking, uh, uh, what, do you, what do you call it? What you call it? The the Justice League? Was it Aquaman in the Justice League? Walking around in his Aquaman suit, and everybody's like, "Hey, is that the Legacy outfit?" Yeah, it is. I like to wear my Legacy outfit around Justice League headquarters. But when I'm in the water, I'm free. I strip it off. Uh, 
I, so there was Aqualad, but like he, I don't know if I, that was Aquaman's son or like he was just another. Uh, he was a uh, like I said, the Aquaman fuck a fish. I don't fucking know, dude. I get no idea. I get, and I don't care. I don't need a whole movie mythologizing Aquaman and telling me what happened with his family and where they went and who did what and why it happened. And I just, just get to the fucking fish fucking, get to the fucking fish fighting, get to the, whatever the fuck he's got to do. And yes, Black Manta or whatever the fuck, he looked pretty cool. He's got that weird round head and he's in there shooting guys with his eyes and whatever the fuck. And, uh, and, but here's the whole premise of the Aquaman trailer. They're just like, uh, all right, you know what? There's a war about, and here's the bad thing the, they're we're bringing it to the surface. And uh, and I want to know. Here's my question for you, as as Aquaman fans, since you have all the answers. Yeah, that's right. You stepped to me. You brought this up. You fucking came to me with your Aquaman bullshit, and you were like, "Hey, man, what's the deal with Aquaman? We we can defend him no matter what you fucking bring our way. We want to meet his parents. <laughs> we totally, we totally want to meet Aquaman's parents. I don't need to meet the parents of any fictional character. I really don't. Do I want do I want to meet Lemony Snicket's parents in a flashback? Fuck no. I don't want to meet any. I don't want to know fucking Iron Fist's parents. I don't want to know Power Man's parents. Punisher's parents I don't give a fuck I mean unless you're gonna really do a deep dive like if you give me a full on Punisher movie freshman year and I can see them be shitty to him and his parents are like mean and they were the guy you know dad wears a wife beater and the mom is you know on the street fucking guy's missionary position with one foot out the window as they figure out the schematic I never did finish that did I I was talking about banging a hooker and uh, Chinese acrobats because he's got an Ocean's 10 look at me remembering things now see I thought I couldn't remember everything um but prostitutes, they have to have a schematic, right? They they know all the they know the drill. You just you just have cock will travel. But you get a prostitute in the car, and she's gonna go. All right, this is a Kia. So with a Kia, you got to put your knee here. I got to put my knee here. You got to put your hand here. Don't touch my weave, and let's get this done. Uh, that's the only thing I can think of. With the prostitute has to know like the 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 standard car that they're in. All right, this is a Hyundai, which means, you know, those tricky Koreans. So I'm going to go ahead and put my ass here. You're going to put your ass up against this window. Now it's going to leave a print. Now I will try not to pant. And, and look, by the way, the hookers aren't breathing heavy because uh, they, you're not, you're not sexually pleasing a hooker at all. They're just, they're just getting it over with. I got to imagine, right? Don't they, aren't they just, they're just laying there and they might, they might as well be the bowl of jello I fucked when I was fucking 13 or 14. You just, you just want to put your cock in them. They're just like, oh, um, they're like Jane Fonda and Clute. They're like, oh baby. And they look at their fucking nails. I mean, except now it's a cell phone and they're told, and they, cause again, hookers like bang, 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 bang. They just want to fucking get you in and out because it's, it's, you know, all loads all the time. They just want to make as much fucking money as they possibly can. No hooker's going to lay there with you and just be like, oh, let's, you know what? Why don't we bask in the afternoon? Afterglow. There is no afterglow at all. Literally, by the by, the third time you go, they're they're climbing out the window with probably your wallet and whatever the fuck money you owed them. So don't even think that you're gonna fucking please a hooker. I don't care what kind of car. All right, this is a Range Rover. Well, here's the thing: you've got to get hard and put it through the steering wheel. And I'm gonna go over here, and I'm, I'm just they know everything. Hookers have uh, a schematic where they can just flip in the book, and it just it breaks. Like you ever buy tickets, and it has the seating chart for every stadium. That's what hookers have for every car. The best sex positions for every single car. Oh, this is a Chevy Caprice Classic? Well, here's the thing. you got to put this seat down and lay this seat back. And then I'm going to go ahead and put my face here in the back window. I mean, it's like that's how it works. They, and they also know the fastest, quickest, most efficient way to get you off so they can get out and hop into another fucking Chevy Tahoe or a Blazer or some other Chevy product to get another guy off. So they can climb into a Ford F-150 and have a hillbilly have sex with them while he fucking dreams about whatever the fuck he's going to do with his life the rest of the time he's not banging a hooker. Um, and, and look, hookers have, uh, there's another thing, hookers, sex workers have all the power in that exchange. Nah, I wish, I hope so. I'm, and look, I'm not disrespecting sex workers. Like I just said, they're all like fucking MacGyver. They got a fucking, they got a schematic. They got a goddamn book of um, of layouts, the best seating chart to get fucked in. They're perfect. They got it all. Uh, <laughs> so... So let's talk more about Aquaman instead of talking about hookers getting fucking laid by Ocean's 10. Um, so Aquaman, again, so in this thing, they're like, we're going to take the fight to the surface. And uh, and I, I, I'm sure that what's going to happen is just like Superman. OK, it's literally it's Black Panther and Superman, but it's like Superman came from space and he kind of likes humans, but he really likes Kryptonians. But now these are his chosen people that he's going to protect. So I'm sure Aquaman is like, ah, I love fish town. And then they're like, hey, we're ba- we're bailing on a fish town and we're going to fuck up the surface people. And Aquaman's kind of like, yeah, hey, uh, not for nothing. I understand your, your, what you're thinking. But, uh, you know, I got some waterfront property up there. Like, I got a place. Like, I got a lighthouse that I actually grew up in and my parents are up there. I, you might know her. She was the queen down here at one point, but then she fucking bailed on you guys for no reason whatsoever because she probably fell in love with a guy from the wrong side of the fucking ocean. Literally, she... she, she <laughs> 
<laughs> she fell in love with a dude from the wrong side of the reef. There was some dude out on Coral Reef, and she swam up like a fucking mermaid off a tuna can and was like, hi, I'm the queen of the undersea world. And he's like, great, my name's Chuck. And they fucked, and then they had a baby in a lighthouse. And that's how fucking Aquaman was conceived. And that's why she gave up her queendom. She turned around and just threw her fucking crown, and it sunk to the bottom. Everybody's like, our queen, what is she doing? Well, she's fucking making macaroni and cheese for Chuck in the lighthouse because she got tired of you and your fishy bullshit. Uh, but now Aquaman's like, all right, they're, they're like, we're taking this war to the surface. And Aquaman's, hey, I, again, I get it. But I, I lived most of my life up there. Like, I just found you guys here in Fishtown. I don't know if I want to go ahead and lead the armies of the fishes to take on the surface people because, you know, they were pretty cool to me. Uh, other than the fact that we're, people were not, like, really great in high school when I talked to that piranha. But still... Uh, and also, I have to be truly honest. If, if Aquaman's the one negotiating that, because I don't know if he is, maybe because maybe he goes full in. Maybe he's like, yeah, you know what? Let's fuck up the surface people. I'm excited about that. God damn it. Let's go. They were shitty to me. Maybe, maybe, because again, I don't know anything about it. Maybe Fishtown is perfectly content being Fishtown and they're fine down there. And then Aquaman shows up and he goes, hey, I got news for you. Those guys are eating you every fucking day, raw and cooked. Let's go fuck these motherfuckers up. And then they're like, yeah, we got to follow this new guy who looks like them and sort of looks like us. Uh, he's got gills and long hair. He's got lungs and gills, whatever the fuck. So then he rallies them in. Maybe he's, you know what? He might be the fucking Hitler of Fishtown. Like he rolls in and he fucking, because everything's fine. They're all content. And then he says, ha ha, the other. We need to go up there and get the surface dwellers because they're taking your jobs. What jobs? We're fish people. Yeah, well, trust me. They're, well, they're doing bad things with you guys. They're eating you. They're mounting you. They're putting you on a wall. You know what a talking billy bass is? <laughs> and they're just like, I don't know what the fuck that is. He's like, get over here, bass. And a bass swims over and he just fucking nails it to a wall. And he goes, now, say witticisms. And he's like, holy fuck, they're doing that to us up there? You're goddamn right they are. They're fucking nailing Billy Bass into a wall and making him say witticisms, making him talk like corn pone Bill Engvall. And they're like, fuck this. We're taking this war to the surface. And fucking Aquaman lives out his life as fucking Fishtown Hitler. Uh... Or I have to say this, if, if Aquaman tries to quell their disturbance, if Aquaman's a guy who's just like, you know what, man, I don't, uh, I got to be honest, I'm not on board with this fucking thing where we're going to go up and fight everybody because I lived up there and everybody was pretty cool. And the fish guys are like, uh, that's great. Why the fuck should we, should we listen to you, Haffy? And he's like, Haffy? They're like, yeah, you might as well be a fucking mermaid because you're half fucking us and half fucking them. So you might as well have a tail like a mermaid, you fuck. And, uh, and Aquaman's like, what? And then his hair, his tendrils all shoot the fuck out. And he rips off his shirt to reveal his legacy outfit. And they're like, holy shit, he's got the orange top on. He means business. He's got a fucking trident. Him and Aqualad go off and fuck up some people just down there. On the, and just keep your, you know what? Keep your ghetto fish town rumbles under the waves, goddammit. Because we just want to come to the beach, watch the sunset, have some guys skateboard, have some fucking kebabs at some fucking shop, and then go home. Nobody wants to deal with the fact that maybe, just maybe, underneath the waves, there's a fucking roiling fish town who's ready to come up and fuck up the surface people. Because I got news for you. I'm surface people. I don't want to fight some fish, dude. Because, again, I, I, I take a shot to the fucking breadbasket, take a shot right in the old Widowmaker, and what am I doing? I'm coughing up fucking vomit, and this dude's like, ha-ha! And then he goes on and he fucks somebody else up. And I get stabbed in the neck with a goddamn jeweled trident. Uh, but at least it's the jeweled trident. I don't want to get stuck with some fucking plain trident. Don't fucking come after me with a plain trident. Come after me with something jeweled, man. I want to die at the hands of a fucking fancy weapon. Uh, but in the trailer, they're like, yes, we're taking this war to the surface. <laughs> and again, like I said, I have to admit whether, whether Aquaman's encouraging it or he's discouraging it, or he's going to lead the war or he's going to fight Black Manta or whatever, the, or fight alongside him. I don't know. But, but as I've mentioned before, like with the Terminator franchise, uh, it makes zero sense if you think about it for fucking, for, I was gonna say five minutes, not even, if you think about it for 60 seconds, the Terminator fucking franchise, it's, it completely debunks itself. Hey, uh, we're robots from the future, and we want to kill all of you to stop the human uprising. All right, why? Well, because you're humans, and you're trying to destroy robots. Okay, great. So what happens if you kill all the humans? Well, then we will have a robot utopia. And and what does that entail? Well, we'll we'll uh, we'll hang out and do a bunch of cool-ass robot stuff, and we'll tell stories about the time that one of us stepped on one of your skulls in the first five seconds of a movie, and it looked really cool. All right, so... Basically, you don't have a real beef with us. Well, you're trying to kill us. Well, I, I get that, T-1000. We're trying to kill you, and you'll be back and all the other bullshit. I get it. However, uh, why, why couldn't you guys just be like, hey, we're robots, and you guys are humans, and let's be cool about this, and not try to take over the world and blow shit up? Why would Skynet become self-aware and then blow a bomb off and then fucking ruin everything? Because you just want to enter the, the world, the globe, into perpetual warfare? Is that what you're looking for? Let me ask you this. Is Dick Cheney a Terminator by any chance? Is he a T-1000? Is he a T-11? Whatever the fuck. Because, uh, you know, he shot... He, didn't he shoot Justice Scalia in the face or somebody? He shot a friend in the face. Him and Scalia, they shot a dude in the face. And they got away with it. 
probably because Skynet was like, yeah, no, he went self-aware a little too quick. And they they fucking, they twisted a wire and fl- flipped out a chip and Cheney fucking stood down. Because, again, that's another dude who won't die. All these fucking old-ass white dudes just won't die. So maybe they're Terminators. Maybe the, ter- maybe the T-1000, because we mythologize them. And I'll tell you what, this makes complete sense. In the movies, the Terminators are unstoppable killing machines. They're all muscly white guys. Well, in real life, who would think that up? If who, What real Terminators would make that up? A bunch of fat, doughy, 70-year-old fucking white dudes who can't be killed because they're robot and fucking pocket watch parts on the inside. So they mythologize themselves as these great fucking muscly robots. They all want to look like Schwarzenegger. So like, yeah, we'd be naked and we'd beat up a bunch of these stupid bikers and we'd take their fucking clothes and we'd chase Sarah Connor and we'd shoot everybody in the face. Uh, but as is now, we're just eating cocktail franks and talking to lobbyists. Fuck. Man, I want to say that all the politicians are behind it. But, but fuck yeah, it could be just anybody. Because when did that movie come out? It came out in fucking 84. So that's Reagan. That's straight up Reagan. And I know it's supposed to be some sort of mythology for the Reagan years and against the you know, the depersonalization of human beings and shit like that. And by the way, don't watch the first Terminator. It does not hold up at all. Uh, but why? But why? So again, you think about it for five seconds. You're just like this. Why would the robots want to kill everybody? Because then you kill them all. And then you what? Sit around and tell them robot stories. We we got a robot planet. Yay. And then what? You go take over other robot planets. It's the same way I think about like war here. OK, so you you fuck up Syria. And then what? Do you really think Syrians will be happy with you turning their fucking country into glass? You think that'll be a good thing? Well, but it'll eliminate the Syrian threat. What Syrian threat? They're coming over here and trying to make bread in fucking Minnesota when they go to a refugee city or whatever the fuck. Why are you mad at them? Why are the robots mad at us? You went, you guys, because the robots clearly provoked this. All right. Now, humans are dumb because they built the fucking robots and they should have made them uh, given the prime directive. You got to cross Robocop with Terminator. Give them the prime directive to the robots because the Terminator robots clearly did not have the prime directive. Uh, Creep. So uh, here's what I think. In Aquaman, it's the same deal, man, where the uh, <laughs> Terminator falls apart on its face if you talk about it for more than a minute. Same thing with Aquaman. These guys, these fish dudes are like, we're taking this war to the surface. I throw this out to you, all of you, everyone. As I just mentioned with Aquaman saying, hey, Billy Bass on the fucking wall. Uh, would you blame the fish people if they came and fucked us up? I mean, we have been ruining everything for them. We dump shit into the ocean. We fucking drive around with jet skis. We got bros out there laughing and punching sharks in the nose. We got all of us fucking eating sushi all day and and pulling lobsters out of the ocean and laughing at them and taking pictures of them holding knives and cigarettes. Like they, We've made the ocean like an amusement park for our amusement. Now, granted, we will send those deep diving fucking things in there to record the horror sounds of the of the nether ocean or whatever the fuck when they get really deep. and that Because that's the scary ocean when it's like totally pitch black and then that like see-through fish shows up. He's always that way. And you, by the way, did you know this? This is totally true. You ever see that see-through fish? We're like, holy fuck, look at this translucent fish because down here there's no light so they don't have to grow any fucking skin or whatever. Dude, did you know that there's really only one of those fucking see-through fish he just he just he is a fucking glory hog he sees a camera he comes rolling out of the deep he's like hello how you doing because that fish is just auditioning that's all he's fucking doing he's like hey i'm the see-through fish like he wants to come to the surface and be put in a fucking cushy ass aquarium because down there look man you're scary looking to us but down there there's a bunch of creepy shit in the ocean that aren't scared of see-through fish they're not so they want to eat them and also Nobody wants to specifically eat see-through fish because, again, like I said, there's just one. He's just that one camera fucking friendly see-through fish. But whales don't give a fuck. You ever see a whale eat when they just, like, open their mouth and they swim for 45 miles and anything that's around gets sucked in there? They don't give a fuck if it's a, if it's a, a fish or a crab or a lobster or a fucking uni or, or, or amoebas or a, a fucking puppeteer. They don't give a shit. They eat it all. Whatever the fuck is floating as they swim by with their mouth open is getting fucking gacked into a whale belly. Uh, and then unfortunately we wind up killing them and then they float to the surface and then somebody blows it up because it's stranded on the beach and then everybody gets whale guts all over themselves in a famous clip from fucking 40 years ago. Uh, but I mean, I'm on, I'm on, I'm I'm back in the fish. I'm back in the fish people. If they want to fucking start a war, if they want to come after us, I'm totally back in the fish people. Fuck that. You want to step up? You want to try to fucking beat down the fish people? It's not happening. I'm, I'm citing, I'm, I'm going on record right now. I'm telling you right now as we speak. Uh, I am absolutely going on, on record with the fish people and I am, I am on their side. I'm on their side. I will also side with the robots in the Terminator war. Now, will that matter to the robots? Probably not. I would assume I'll be the first guy killed because I'll be the Ellis from Die Hard of the Terminator wars. As I walk up and I go, Hey, T-1000, booby. 
I can, I'm your white knight. And then they're just like, what, weirdo? And then they fucking, you know, Han, the Hans Gruber of the Terminators f- strings me along, and then he kills me on the phone, so John Connor goes, what? No, they're not your friends, Mike. And I'd be like, bullshit, man. I'm totally here. Come on, just give yourself up. Holly wants you to, I want you to, and they're going to be like, who's Holly? And I'm going to go, I don't, I don't know a Holly. <laughs> that's, that's, I haven't corrupted a Holly yet. I got time. We got 10 more years of this fucking podcast to corrupt a Holly. And I'll tell you what, if you think this makes me a fucking traitor that I'm siding with the fish people, I, you know, fuck you. Who are you siding with? Aquaman? Down there trying to protect us? What's he protecting us for? He's, again, he's half, he's half aqua, half man. Be the aqua. Just, I, I trust you to be more aqua. Because I'll tell you what, you might be half man. That's fine. You lived up here. You're friends. Like I said, you got waterfront property. Your, your fucking mom ran a lighthouse, whatever the fuck. Uh, but you're, if you can breathe underwater, you're tons more aqua than you are man. You're, you're just like a total fish. And, and like I said, we've been ruining the ocean fucking forever. We got guys dumping beer cans in there and we're fishing and we're eating and guys are cooking stuff and just, I, I, we all deserve to get fin fucked. Seriously, every fish should just come on land and fucking destroy us. And who, again, like I said, you think Aquaman's going to go get the Justice League to fucking help, what, fight off the fish? They'd look at him and go, dude, you're half fish. We got no interest in this. Because again, he's the dork of the Justice League, clearly. Besides, uh, what the fuck, Cyclops or Cyborg, whoever the fuck that idiot is. Like, literally, he's like a, he's just this knockoff robot they couldn't even think of a guy they said they made the black and the most generic superhero they could in the dc universe yeah put him in a put gears on him or some shit he's a robot we don't fucking care wonder woman superman batman aquaman cyborg why not cyborg man why not why not give him some sort of mother modifier rather than just fucking cyborg in a weird red eye i mean there's martian manhunter there's a lot of badass dudes in the dc at least name wise and cyborg what a fucking mess but again, even Cyborg gets to laugh at Aquaman because he's a, he's a robot with robot powers and he can plug into an electrical outlet and scare everybody and shoot lightning bolts. What's Aquaman do? Dies in the fucking ocean and then he tries to get help from the Justice League and you know they make fun of him because he's wearing orange pajamas. Like I said, oh, is that your fucking legacy outfit there, Aquaman? Dude, fuck that. So I'm sorry. I'm for the fish people. I am totally backing up the fish people. And I'll join. I'll sign up. I'm in. I'll be leading the vanguard charge. I'll be like the I'll be the sellout Renfield of the fucking human race, and I'll just go ahead and just eat bugs and have the fush people love me because I think we've done them a fucking disservice for this goddamn. Life. Haley Joel Osment, fuck, <laughs> yeah, Haley Joel, three names. Oh, I knew it, and it was in my goddamn brain. I'm sorry, I just yelled that for no reason. It just popped into my fucking brain. <laughs> Jesus Christ, I'm ending. I'm ending on that. I'm done. I can't do any more. You guys can get me at Mike and... I'm serious. You think I'm not? I'm ending on that. How do you fucking not end on that? I found out of the blue. Like a bolt like a bolt from the blue. It came shooting out of my goddamn mouth. You see dead people? I see fucking Haley Joel Osment now. I'll never forget that name again. Ha ha ha. Ah, fuck. That's beautiful. I'm so proud of myself now. Because again, I'm, look, I've been losing some of my fastball. I get that. But, but, but that just bringing, being able to bring that in. Sure. It took me, it took me goddamn 50 minutes to remember that cat's name, but there it is. It took me to, you know what? It fuck that. It took me 50 minutes to remember three goddamn names. It was just one name like Cher or Sting. Fuck that. I got it. It was like last week's direct TV operator who I called Madonna, but was really named a different name. I can't say what it was, but you guys, some of you guessed when you wrote me emails, uh, fuck it. Haley Joel Osment. That's three names. I'm proud. I'm done. And that's it. I'm walking. You guys can get me at Mike and Mike Schmidt As I am, seriously, I'm leaving on that. You guys can get me at Mike and Mike Schmidt What if I just kept reading that over and over? You guys can be my friend at Facebook.com slash the 40 year old boy. You can be, uh, you can follow me at Twitter.com slash the 40 year old boy. I'm there. I'm always lurking somewhere in the shadows, tweeting, sending a bluebird your way, perhaps a DM, as the kids call them these days. Uh, so find me at those places. You can also find me at Instagram and Snapchat. You know, those exist, right? Instagram is a bunch of photos that I've posted and I'll be putting more photos up in the next few days. Cause I got a Seattle trip that you got to buy tickets for. Uh, but Instagram and Snapchat, I'm there. I'm Mike four zero Y O B that's four zero Y O B. I am there, uh, being that guy. I'm excited. I'm thrilled. I'm, I'm someone that you should, uh, reckon with. No, you shouldn't, but I'm on Instagram and Snapchat. If you want to find me over there and, uh, all those other places you look for me, I'm there. Let's go ahead and talk about this. Uh, did you know that the new Mike, uh, the new Mike Schmidt comedy dot com has launched? The new website is up. Go take a look at it if you have not seen it just yet. Amazing oil paintings from our great friend David Hernandez and uh, an amazing web building from our friend Ryan Dirks. We send him all the stuff and he able to put the puzzle together. An amazing hover text by me. Now, I'll tell you right now, it's Tuesday. The hover text is not done. So it might not be there yet, but I'll be, I'll keep letting you know when it's going to be there, but go check out the fucking amazing artwork that Mex did. Uh, the contact page is just, I, I want that on my wall. I mean, it's just fucking gorgeous. Um, 
And on the contact page, you can get email. We got all the links for that. We've got uh, we've got the new merch page. I'll tell you know what. I'll talk a little bit more on the other side about it. But well, fuck no. I'm talking about it now. Why don't I talk about it now? Uh, MikeSchmidtComedy.com. It's got the bio page. It's got uh, it's got the Joe Business page. It's got the appearances page, which is new. And that'll be telling you about Twitch streams or Facebook or YouTube streams that are going to be coming up. That's also not just going to be for live appearances. It's going to be all for uh, for all sorts of appearances. Um, you know, I, I will tell you this. We went ahead and got away from the the naming, the colloquialisms we had for the pages. You know how there was the Joe Business page, the Hi, I'm Mike page, the You Guys Can Get Me At page. Well, you know, there are new people getting involved with the show every week, which is really fucking great. But then they go to the website and they see those things and maybe the shorthand doesn't work for them. So what we did is uh, we've made the pages. There's the home page. There's the Mike page. There's the media page. There's the appearances page. There's the contact page. Uh, all that kind of stuff. And it, But if you go to those pages, on the bio page, it says, Hi, I'm Mike. If you go to the merch page, it, sa- it says uh, Joe Business. So we've kept the names, but just they're self-contained on the page themselves. So uh, so check them out and click around. Man, there's fun light boxes in there. Uh, the shirt one is a fun one. You know, all that stuff. And also the hover text, like I said, I'm, I'm in the middle of it, and it should be up soon either piecemeal or at some point, but I'll, I'll also let you know when that's all, but please go check out the new Mike Schmidt comedy.com. Uh, Max did a fucking amazing job of painting all of the new ass paintings and our new ass paintings. Why would I even throw ass in that sentence? And Ryan Dirks, who is available at facebook.com slash Ryan Dirks. He's the coolest guy ever. And he built, uh, the website. Once we gave him all of the puzzle pieces, he went ahead and loaded it. He, uh, he changed it from Drupal to whatever the fuck he can work with. I, I, I don't know anything. I just, I say yes to a lot of the stuff that Ryan asks and, uh, and go be Ryan's friend and thank him for his good work. If you could, if you write him a note and also, uh, he's got, uh, you know, tell him you're thinking about him. He's got, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's a guy who's got some stuff he's going through. We're all going through. So tell him to stay strong because he's our guy. He's our web guy. Uh, Giovanni Giorgio Peluso, of course, is the guy who did the YouTube channel. Did you me- hey, have I mentioned the YouTube channel? I think I should. That exists now. There's all sorts of videos on there. Uh, all of this shows doc- uh, documented archives. If I, I don't know why they're documented. But the archives for this show are there for the last 10 years. Go ahead and check those out. I would recommend a deep dive into year six. That seems to be the pattern that a lot of people are following. Uh, but all the shows are up. Listen to year one and year four and year nine. They're all available for you to go ahead and peruse and listen and jam right into your naked steaming ears via your iPod vaginas. Uh, so that's uh, Giovanni Giorgio Peluso was the one who built that page, and he's the coolest. You can find him at Facebook.com slash Giovanni Giorgio Peluso. Not to me, boss. Uh, he's available there and, uh, you can go ahead and listen to his podcast as well. The get it on podcast, the geo podcast that's available on iTunes and the outdoor FAQ podcast. And also please know he does a ton of work for Loveline. Please know he's personal friends with Adam Carolla. Please know that Dr. Drew once lent him $9. One of those is not true or one of those actually, let's put it this way. One of those may not be true. I can't speak to which one, the one that I made up might actually have happened at some point, but I can't say for sure. Uh, but Giovanni Giorgio Peluso is our great friend. He does all uh, all the big lifting on the YouTube channel and all sorts of other cool stuff. And he's the one kind of coaching me through streaming, along with our friend Jaden. Remember when I talked about Jaden? I'll talk about that on the other side, maybe, uh, if I remember. I'll try to. <laughs> and also, please remember that David Mex Hernandez, our friend David Hernandez, uh, does all of the artwork for the U- for the website for fucking you know the new YouTube stuff. Uh, you know he he threw up the the new title page. Um, fuck, fighting off a yawn. He uh. And he does, he does all the artwork for the show. I mean, look how amazing today's is. It's just, it's just fucking incredible stuff. Um, full disclosure, I don't know what today's is. But, but I'm sure it's going to be amazing. <laughs> i got to call him as soon as I'm done with this. Uh, all right. So, folks, uh, David Hernandez is available at Facebook.com slash David Mex Hernandez. You can be his friend there and tell him how great he is and how cool he is and how all the great work he does is fucking appreciated. Uh, and you can also, you want to do that monetarily? You want to get him on board with doing some stuff for you? Go look at the website and look at that stuff and think about, oh, man, I could have that stuff in my house. Now, you could actually have those paintings in your house, um, but he could also create some stuff for you. You could buy existing stuff. He's got Valscapes. He's got Gaikons. He's got all of this stuff on sale at artbydmh.com. That's A-R-T-B-Y-D-M-H.com. As I mentioned, he's got tons of pre-existing pieces for sale. Um, I know he had a Miles Davis painting. He just did a Pennywise painting that's fucking incredible. I don't know if it's for somebody or if he's just going to keep it himself, but boy, is it great. Um... So go to the website, artbydmh.com. Check out all the cool stuff. Like I said, if you want to buy existing pieces, they're available. If you want him to do custom pieces for you, he can do that. Uh, he'll paint you. He'll paint your friends. He'll paint your dogs. He'll paint your cats. He'll paint a rat. 
He'll paint it Woody Cody in a boat, Woody Cody on a moat. He would do all of those goddamn things. But it's up to you. It's incumbent upon you to reach out first to our friend David Mex Hernandez. And the only way to do that is to send him a note over at artbydmh.com. That's A R T B Y D M H dot com. Shady the crew. Shady the crew. Shady the crew. Folks, we have sponsors. Yes, we do. We've got sponsors. How about you? Do you have any sponsors? Who's sponsoring you? Uh, if you're an AA, you've got several sponsors. you got one guy, right? Isn't there an AA? I think you get one dude who you can call up to and cry in the middle of the night that you're about to drink some rubbing alcohol, and he saves you. Uh, that's, a, that's a drag. <laughs> you like you join AA, and then they assign you some fucking out of work schlub who just like can't fucking control himself. But I guess at one point you were the out of work schlub who can't control himself. And in the larger scheme of things, aren't you all just friends of Bill? I think you are. Uh, I had to go to AA when I was a kid. Not AA, I went to Alateen. I went to Alateen, and then I went to an AA meeting here when I was disillusioned and lost. Before I found Shannon, I was looking for something to do with my life. And I was like, who can I reach out to? What should I do? And I wound up in an AA meeting. And uh, again, if those people would just shut up and listen to me, I would enjoy those meetings. However, everybody's got a fucking story. Oh, my Christ, I get it. You and booze and your sister and you're sad and glug glug and what the fuck and hiccups. And I, I yes, perfect. Way to go, Snuffy Smith. You got your fucking corn liquor in your X, triple X jug and you're pulling off the cork and taking a pull. I get it. Things went south. Uh <laughs> That sounds mean, but at the same time, when you're in the meeting, you're just like, boy, this joint just smells like stale coffee and cigarettes and sadness. A lot of people who've lost their way, a lot of trains off the rails. And look, I'm not I'm not coming after you guys if you're in AA. Like I said, I went to Alateen. It helped me immeasurably as a child to know that there were other people going through the same shit I was going through, that somebody else might have had a dad who fucking got jumped in a bar fight and shit his pants and then tried to break your mom's arm. Not on the same night. That would be way too much night for my dad. Uh, but he did, he did some not cool stuff. And so to go talk to Alateen people, and I never talked. Like, it was this thing where I never wanted to talk about anything that was going on. And then when I went up in Alateen, I, I actually spoke once and shared, and I felt amazing. And they all came up to me afterwards, and they just they showed me this. Uh, they, they were just really great. I mean, it was – and I've been to a couple of meetings here in California. Like I said, I went to an AA meeting, uh, and then I went to another meeting that I'm not going to get into. But it was uh, – that was another time I was lost and kind of disillusioned. And that meeting, again, like I said, it was great I because Shannon had recommended a couple of things for me. And I enjoy – you know, I like talking, certainly. I like when it's my time to talk. But then the listening to everybody else and, oh, you want to talk about – you know what literally – you know what those meetings are that they turn into? It's just live Twitter. It's just live Facebook. And then uh, I couldn't believe it. I had to find whiskey. Uh, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. Listen to my story because I could actually tell a goddamn story and I'm interesting. Uh, and I got problems too. Oh, do I have problems? Anyway, the whole point of this thing that I was saying was, uh, oh, sponsors. <laughs> Uh, you know, the Paranoid Strain podcast sponsors this show. They're amazing. They do amazing work over there at the compound. Fearful Jesuit is in charge of the whole thing. And uh, this month's episode, the one, well, he's doing a two-parter. He's, uh, he's got right now part one of his 9-11 show is up. And it is, uh, man, I'll tell you what, it is a gripping listen. Because uh, he's divided it into two separate parts. Like this one that it's airing now, the one that you can find in the iTunes store right now, is a, a general laying out of the facts and debunking a lot of the conspiracy theories that were floating around 9-11 and, quite frankly, are still floating around 9-11. I'm, I'm excited because he says next month is going to be, or the next episode, not, might not be next month, but the next episode is going to get into the really fucking crazy people about 9-11. Um, but listening to the show, it was, it, you know, I will tell you this. You will find out this about Fearful Jesuit, a guy who is hosting a television or a podcast, I should say, debunking myths. And yet he admits that he agrees with conspiracy people on at least one thing. I'm not going to tell you what it is. got to listen to find out. Uh, but the show is very powerful because uh, Fearful Jesuit lived in New York. He was there. He saw the towers come down. Uh, and he relates his story. I won't go into it because I don't want to steal his thunder. But he tells you exactly what the day was like for him. But also the opening of the show is it's him and some people that he knew and friends that he had who lived it and saw it all happen. And they're relating their own personal anecdotes and he lays them over one another. And it's just this cascade. Uh, you know what? They, they, 
their their experiences fall down on you like the towers. They they are that heavy and they and they will really weigh on you once you hear them. Um, he plays the voicemails from the plane, the people who were trapped on the plane, and then. Uh, and then, of course, he details all the fucking piles of fucking minutiae of people trying to discredit the most terrifying and final moments of these people's lives, because that's what conspiracy people do. You know, people are on the plane, they're calling, they're like, ah, there's a guy in business class, he got stabbed, and, and then these other people are like, well, did she look like, uh, did she sound nervous? It's like, dude, how dare you? How dare you corrupt the memories of people who were killed in a tragedy? It just, it's just awful. Uh, by the way, I was the one who was just making fun of people in AA. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm saying, how dare you to these guys? Uh, yeah, I will say this. He also answers the question, can jet fuel melt steel beams? And the answer, of course, is no. So uh, that's that's something to get through. Uh, maybe the answer wasn't no. I don't want to say that for sure. Um, but it's great. But I will tell you this. The thing that was really weird is he, uh, you know, his, his artist, the guy who does all of his images, uh, does a good, uh, you know, a fantastic job. And the images match exactly what the narrative is. But uh, but I guess he's a fucking wingnut. He's also bananas. And he's a, but here's the thing: he's a friend of Fearful Jesuits. So Fearful Jesuit normally he's throwing around that these guys are fucking crazy bombs at everybody. But he can't do it at his buddy because his buddy does his artwork, and because he's just been his friend forever and ever and ever. So, but they have genuine discussions about this. This dude, get this: this dude not only is he uh, he he's all in on the 9/11 conspiracy stuff, and then Jesuit tries to talk to him about it and give him some evidence. But uh, but it turns out the fucking art guy doesn't think we went to the moon. And I, I at that point you're just like, all right, we're done talking. We're we're finished. Uh, I will tell you this: he also goes after Prince at one point, which I was fucking furious about. I don't even know why I'm running down this entire episode. Go listen to it; it's fucking fantastic. Uh, Fearful Jesuit does the Paranoid Strain. It's available in the iTunes Store. You can grab it now and download it and check it out and listen to it. And do me a favor: post a review in the iTunes Store, letting him know that you listened and you found it through us and you loved it and you were a fan. And uh, like I said, it lets him know that uh, people are, are are feeding back into the loop and listening to us and following our advice. Uh, write him a note right in the beginning of the episode. He tells you how to include like an audio clip. Maybe he plays that on the show. You can actually write him and tell him what you think of the show. But Fearful Jesuit does an amazing job. As I've mentioned before, anybody who does something that I can't do and to have the discipline to do an hour and 45 minute show where you actually sit down and basically script it out. And uh, I, I don't do that as you as witnessed by today. I mean, I, do, I literally screamed Haley Joel Osment's name in your fucking ear because it popped into my head. and I was so mad at myself. I couldn't pull it earlier, but he's very disciplined. He does amazing things, uh, and and it's a really good show. I'm proud to be affiliated with it. The Paranoid Strain, available now in the iTunes store. And uh, and he's also on Twitter. He's also on, I, I don't know if he's on Facebook, but he's on Twitter. I think he's also got a website, maybe paranoidstrain.com. Uh, check all that stuff out, man, and tell him what you think of his entire package and tell him that we were the ones that sent you and wanted you to consider all this cool stuff because Fearful Jesuit is a friend of mine, and I am very glad and uh, proud to be associated with him and his show, which I think is very, very high quality. And I thank him for wanting to be involved in mine and pretending that he likes this one which is really cool um i have another friend who uh isn't technically a sponsor really but this is a friend of the show named paul pepper now i've talked about paul pepper on here before one time i read a very long (laughs) he had like a dog hospital or something i don't remember what the fuck it was he had like a he had some fundraiser where they were going to try to raise money for dogs for like a month and this is not even a joke. I read it live with Mex. Like the first time I read it, we read it live and we had fun doing it. Uh, and and I'm I'm talking the instant the show went live, uh, there were hurricanes in like Puerto Rico and everywhere else. Like all, all of the garbage that happened to our planet happened right after I pitched his fucking his fundraiser for the dogs. And he wrote me and he said, "Look." You don't have to fucking say this anymore. I know that I know that people aren't going to come, and I know that there's a lot more important things to do, saving lives, than than bailing out this this rescue place. And then look, we all care about everything. We want to help dogs. We want to have cats. Uh, help cats. We want to help people. Uh, but people, you know, probably take a priority. And it was good on Paul to recognize that. And and I told him, I go, look, dude, I'm happy to do it. I'm happy to read it. And he's just like, nah, dude, I don't feel right doing it. Uh, so Paul has approached me again. And Paul has another project that he's involved in, uh, and and here's what he's asking for. He's not even asking for money. He's not asking for donations. You know what he's asking for? He's asking for likes. He's asking for subscribers. He's asking for clicks because Paul uh, Paul has done an unbelievable job of converting a truck. He's put, he's put a lot of money into it, and he's put a, a lot of time into it, and uh, he has a tribute truck. And it's a truck that is a tribute to first responders. So it's a tribute to police, it's a tribute to firemen, and it's a tribute to anybody who rushes into the face of danger while everyone is rushing the other way. And uh, one of the most amazing things, it's like, well, so go look at the truck. First of all, if you go to Dark Knight First Responder Tribute Truck, that's a page on Facebook, 
Dark Knight First Responder tribute truck. And I will tell you this. It's night as in nighttime, not night as in Batman. It's first with the number 1ST. It's not the F-I-R-S-T. So it's Dark Knight as in nighttime first, which is 1ST, Responder Tribute Truck. And uh, he has a web page. He's got a Facebook page. And he just wants people to go like it. He wants And he wants to look at the fucking truck because the truck is... It's astonishing what he's had done to it, the the paint job. The most amazing thing of all to me is he has stripes painted alongside the truck. And uh, and within the body of the stripes are the names of all the first responders that died at the Twin Towers uh, on 9-11. So... Uh, it's an astonishing tribute. It's he went out of his way to do this. He's not, I don't think he's a cop. He's I think he's just an over the road. I don't want to say just. Yeah, I think he's an over the road trucker. Right? But he and his wife Gloria have seen me live. They're wonderful people. And uh, and all he all he wants is likes. He'd like you to go look at his truck, and uh, and and say you know what this is cool. I mean this is a cool last thing because again, the more his social media pages get hit and the more people he gets liking, then the more people he can get to sponsor stuff. And then he brings the because he brings the truck to events. He brings it to when they're you know like a fundraiser for a fire truck or a firehouse, uh, he's involved heavily in all of that stuff. So please go like his page, Dark Knight First Responder Tribute Truck. And he's also on Instagram at Dark Knight First Responder Tribute. And I think it's just TR. I don't think you could put the truck in there. But if you just put dark, but, you know, and it's, you know, same thing. Night is in nighttime. First, 1ST. And it's all one big name. (laughs) Dark Knight First Responder Tribute Truck. (laughs) <laughs> but if you put in Paul Pepper, I'll bet you'll find it. Uh, and it's, you know, he's only got a couple of pictures of the truck up on Instagram now, but he wants people to follow him on Instagram and like on Facebook. And uh, and Paul does really nice things for me. He's just a friendly guy, cool guy. I wouldn't call him a sponsor. He's just a friend, and I'm trying to help him out by getting him some likes. So like stuff, click stuff on Facebook. Go ahead and follow on Instagram for the Dark Knight First Responder Tribute Truck. And hey, man, I know cops listen to this show. I got some guys like Lou and, and some other guys. Uh, you know, he, he wants to tour with the truck. He wants to come to events and, and things like that. So if you're interested, get in contact with Paul. Maybe he can bring the truck to your event. And I don't know how any of that works because uh, I usually try to spend as little time as possible talking to cops uh, and firemen because if I'm ever talking to cops and firemen, bad things are happening. Bad things are afoot. Very rarely are they coming up to me and going, hey, Mike, we enjoy your show. There's a handful, certainly. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going to Seattle, and there was a cop who came to my show last time. I forget who it was. God damn it. It wasn't Lou. It was a different cop who lived in uh, – because I we used to joke I had one cop listener, and then a bunch of cops wrote me. They're like, no, we listen too, dude. So I was like, all right, fine with me. I'm in. Uh, so like the page, like the truck and be cool and everything's happy and we're happy and you're happy. And, uh, and I love Paul and I love uh, fearful Jesuit and I love anybody who loves this show and sponsors and does cool ass things. Uh, please remember we've got the website as I've mentioned many different times to you guys. Oh, well, let's, all right, let's plug this real quick. I, I, I should have my plugs and I don't have them handy, handy. I don't have them right here. Handy as Freddie boom, boom, Washington would say, uh, cause there was stuff I forgot to tell you about last week. You know what? I did the rock solid podcast a couple of weeks ago with our friend, Pat Francis. All of these things came out when I was on, when, uh, on interlude week. So the Rock Solid podcast I did with Pat Francis and, and Kyle Dodson about Guns and Roses is available now. It's in the iTunes store. They've done a couple of episodes since then, but you can still obviously download the one that I did. And it's better than any other fucking episode they did, so why not get it? Because I was great. I was funny. Pat Francis made me laugh harder than anybody in the fucking world with a silly joke that he did that I don't want to repeat. you got to listen to the show and, uh, and hear it. But that's available. I might have even plugged this at one point now that I'm thinking about it, but who cares? It's there. And uh, I did a I did the Movies Made Me podcast with my friend Cheryl Jones. Cheryl had recorded me previously at the Los Angeles Podcast Festival and then reached out to see if I would do a longer bit on her on her Movies Made Me podcast. I did. We talked for a couple of hours. She edited it down, but uh, I, w- I haven't listened to the discussion yet. I know when I was in it, though, it was interesting because Cheryl made me feel engaged and she was very friendly and uh, she knew her stuff. So go ahead and listen to the Movies Made Me podcast for a conversation with me and Cheryl as we uh, we we go ahead and go round and round and we cut up fucking Reservoir Dogs and a few other movies and stuff that uh, that made me the guy I am today. Uh, and I cheated, of course, because I didn't. I was supposed to pick five movies and whatever. I think I did plug these things. God damn it! Now I'm thinking about it. I did plug these things. Uh, hey, do you want to be an Uber driver and a Lyft driver? Of course you do. If you want to be an, um, a, a Lyft driver, go ahead and use the code M I K E seven two double O five seven. Is that the K? Uh, you know what? I shouldn't do this because I don't have these in front of me, and I'm trying to do the, them off the top of my head. Now I'm gonna have to look it up. Hold on, let me get my phone here. Uh, Lyft, and then there's this, and then yeah, you know what? I fucking knew it. Mike seven two double O five seven. That's beautiful. And uh, DJZW1, 
I don't know the rest. God damn it. But there's, I'm, it's an Uber driver. Uh, but I want to thank our buddy Melvin, who signed up to be an Uber driver, and he completed his allotted rides. And I am his Uber pimp because I got my cut. I got my taste, man. Thank you, Melvin, for going ahead and completing your rides. That's the best. And if you guys want it, DJZW1YTTUE. That's it. DJZW1YTTUE. That's my Uber code. If you want to be an Uber driver like our friend Melvin, get out there, hit the road, and do some rides. I know there's a couple of you who have signed up and not completed anything yet, but that's fine. If you think about it, go ahead and complete it because then I'm the Uber pimp and I get a taste of that gig and that's fucking great. I appreciate you guys thinking of me. DJZW1YTTUE and that's all lowercase. That's for Uber if you want to be an Uber driver. And Lyft, Mike720057 and that's all M-I-K-E, that is all caps. And use those codes also if you're a first time rider, if you're referring riders, if you're preferring anybody else because then I get a taste of that and I want to be your Uber and Lyft pimp. Of course I do. Why wouldn't you do that for me? Uh, that seems like begging. But if you do it, that's cool. Thank you. I'm glad you're thinking of me. Um... Let's see. Oh, the website. So yeah, MikeSchmidtComedy.com exists. Go check it out. We've got the Joe Business page where we're still selling the hard copy of the CDs. Uh, those are available, so go ahead and pick those up. All the live stuff is available too, which is, uh, you know, Stop Making Schmidt, Schmidty Comes Alive, Schmidt Alive 2. Those are available. Uh, and then, of course, we've got the Amazon link. That's one of the most important things. We use the Amazon link. We get money. They get money. You get stuff. It works out perfectly for all of us, everybody involved. Uh, and it doesn't cost you anything, man. You just click on that link. You go around. You shop around on Amazon. Whatever you buy, I wind up getting like three cents off of. And then Jeff Bezos, I think he gets $400 million. That's the way it works out. That's usually the payout ratio. $400 million to three cents. But that's okay. That three cents is something I need. I'm happy to give Bezos $400 million if I'm going to get three cents. And I know socialism and I know oh, rich people suck, and I, I, I get all that because I'm on board with that too. But at the same time, I've ordered three things from Amazon this week. So I guess maybe I don't hate Amazon as much as everybody else in the world. Uh, and, and most other people don't hate it either. But I, I don't want to, look, I'm not opening up that can of fucking worms here at the end of the show. Anyway, if Bernie was burning it down, shut the fuck up. Weird socialism. Uh, let's talk about live stuff. Let's do that. Seattle, I'm there this weekend. When you hear this Thursday, there's a show tonight. Okay, tickets are still available for the Political Vigilante Show featuring Graham Elwood, and I'm opening. I'm the first guy you'll see that night, and I'm going to go up and do whatever I do, and I talk, but then Graham's going to come out and do Political Vigilante stuff. We're going to talk some politics and and have a good time. I'm going to bust his balls. It's going to be fun. And then Saturday night, oh, tickets are available at Brown Paper Tickets for that show Thursday, which is 8-9, and then 8-11, never forget, Saturday night, 8-11. We were there at the, uh, and I, I should tell you this. Doors are at 9.30. The show's at 10 on Thursday night. It was at 9 and has been bumped to 10 because they have another show ahead of us. So we're at 10 o'clock on Thursday night. The Political Vigilante show is at 10 o'clock. Doors at 9.30, show at 10. And then afterwards, we'll all hang out and do some fun stuff and talk about politics. Oh, doesn't that sound fun? (laughs) On stage, fun. Off stage, mm, I don't know if that's a debate I want to roil myself into. But then Saturday, doors are still at 7 o'clock or 6.30 for a 7 o'clock show. Between me and Graham Elwood just doing regular stand-up and storytelling. I mean, he might talk politics at that point. I don't know. I don't plan on it. If it comes up, it comes up. But that'll just be a normal stand-up and storytelling show on Saturday night at the uh, Jewel Box Theater at the Rendezvous in Seattle. Tickets available at brownpapertickets.com right now. Go ahead and put in my name or Graham's name, Political Vigilante. Put all that stuff in there, and the ticket links will come up. Or you can find them on uh, Graham's Instagram page, my Instagram page. You can find them on Twitter. We've been tweeting them out and trying to rouse everybody up. Our Saturday's looking okay. Uh, Thursday's still a little Thursday, so it smells like Thursday there if you want to go ahead and help me out with that. Buy some tickets to see me and the Vigilante on Thursday. Buy some tickets to see me and Graham on Saturday. By the way, Graham is still the Vigilante. I don't want to make that weird. Uh, but tickets are available now at brownpapertickets.com. Go in there, put in my name, and click on the link and come and see us on Thursday, and we'll hang out. And uh, I'm going to be in Toronto. I, I will just tell you this. I don't have a, ve- I mean, I don't have the name of the venue just yet, but I will be doing a show, a very impromptu, loosey goosey type of show, if I may use that phrase that my friend Jimmy Pardo has made popular. Uh, I'm there the 17th through the 23rd or through the 22nd. That's September. Uh, that's actually late September. And I know you're thinking I should really be back at school, but instead I'll be in Toronto with you guys. September 17th through the 22nd. I fly into Buffalo, and here's the thing: uh, the show's one thing. I'll, I'll show up, I'll tell stories, we'll talk and hang out. But uh, but I'll be there just hanging out. We we last time I did it, we did axe throwing. Uh, we went to we went to eat dinner in some cool places. We had fun. We had a really good time. And and uh, me and uh, and Ken and Suzanne went on a tour of of Toronto for a while and investigate. I bought weird chips. Uh, I just had a fantastic time, and Tanya and everybody came out. It was it was really Tanya and Mike and Robert and and everybody. There was a million people. Stephen, I believe, was there. So uh, so come out. I mean, in Toronto, I'll be there. They're they're organizing. There's a page actually. Like a, I think there's a 
a Bring Mike Schmidt to Toronto page, possibly, where you can go ahead and find out what's going to be happening. And if there's not, I'll get them to organize one because everybody can go ahead and figure out who can meet when and where. And Ken and John, John Floor and Kenny Fairhall are the ones running the trip and figuring out where I'm going to go. I just show up and get pointed in the right direction. We went to a rage room last time. Our friend Rick Wellbanks is also running it. He was the one who got me the venue. I mean, I, I, I'm excited about all of this. So uh, I'll be in Toronto in September, man, I'll, just for the hangout. And also there will be a show. Hopefully you can come to one or all of those things. That would be fantastic because I'll be there and I love, I love it, man. I love coming to Toronto. It's going to be an annual fucking thing. I really like going. I Because you're all friends. That's the best part. The show is the show and whatever the fuck, and I go there to do whatever. But I, I like coming to hang out with friends because uh, I'm at that point in my life now where I, I it, that's really important to me is to have people that I love and care for and, uh, and that I want to hang out with. So I'll be there in Toronto in September, the 17th through the 22nd. And I, whatever's being organized is being organized. I hope you can attend any or all of it with me. And Seattle tickets again. Have I mentioned those? They're still on sale, sale at brownpapertickets.com. So go ahead and check those out. Uh, in Seattle, I've got, I don't know what's happening there. I know I'm going for roast pork sandwiches with my friend Wayne at some point. Uh, I might be seeing my friend Jeremy. I might be seeing, there's a few people in Seattle who've reached out and, uh, and it might, my schedule is fucking thin. I'm, I'm, I'm so this time, well, no, by the, you know, it's funny. I was waited to record because tomorrow night, which is Wednesday, I'll be seeing Pearl Jam. Uh, and that's going to be fucking great. And then I'm going with listener Michael on Friday to see Pearl Jam. And uh, and then Thursday, there's the show. It's going to be, you know, it's funny. Here's the deal. As it was approaching, I do that thing where I go, oh, man, Seattle's going to be a hassle. Like, I've got to go ahead and I got to fly and I got to pack and I got to get there. And then it's like, I got to figure out where to stay. And I got to, because I will tell you this, dudes, um, your friend Mike, hi, that's me. And yes, I refer to myself in the third person again, just to bookend the show. Why not? Uh, your friend Mike waited a bit before finding a place to stay. Uh, and so the entire city of Seattle sold out because of uh, our friends Pearl Jam and their two shows. Because uh, Pearl Jam is like fish or the dead. People come in from all over the fucking world to check out their shows. And everybody else had the same idea that I did, that maybe seeing them in their hometown would be a really cool thing. So uh, by the time I started looking for a place to stay, everything was full freight. Fucking rental cars were 110 bucks a day. Now that's insane, dude, because usually you can get them for 20 bucks. But uh, rental cars were through the fucking roof. Hotels were bananas, and Airbnb actually sold out. Like, there's nobody offering an Airbnb. So Graham and I got together. We were trying to figure out where we we're going to stay. We we're going to stay in the same place. We we're going to stay separately. He was renting a car. Was I going to? It's it's just it's insane. So finally, I wound up. I'm I'm in, dude. I'm staying in Bellevue because there's nothing downtown. So uh, I'm staying in Bellevue for like four days, and uh, and I'm in I'm in some rat hole. I don't want to say the name of it because you know at least until I check out. When I check out, I'll say it. But it's just. Uh, it's 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 I'm sure it's the please don't stab me in. Uh, I'm excited to be staying there, and I'll be there for four days. So like I said, I get there Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I leave Sunday morning, but uh, but there's no hassle. That's what I'm saying. Is what I did is I made it a huge hassle. I'm like, oh my god, finding a car and paying for Ubers and then going here and it's gonna cost us money. And you know what? Fuck all that, man. Fuck all that. This trip is gonna be fucking amazing. Two great shows with a great friend of mine in a theater that I love. I've performed at twice already that I really enjoy. That they've renovated. They made the restaurant like a badass restaurant. I guess they got a guy from Momofuku as their fucking chef. I can't wait to eat in that joint after the show either Thursday and or fucking Saturday. Uh, and you should too. Eat before the show. Eat after the show. It's 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 going to be – the venue's just the best. And they're always so friendly to me and they're terrific. They always they – just, they're just great people. So, uh, and, and I love it. I'm so thrilled. So, and again, in addition to those two shows, I'm seeing fucking Pearl Jam twice. How the, how the hell am I getting, how would I ever get mad at this? How could I ever make it a hassle? But you know me and you know, I'm a guy who's capable of doing that. Oh man, I can't believe this is happening this way. I got to go ahead and I got to struggle and go here. No, no, fuck you, old man. The old man who lives in my head needs to be fucking banished. He comes out like a cuckoo clock. He just goes around and around my brain and he's like, boop, boop, this sucks. Boop, boop, this sucks. Fuck you. It does not suck. This is going to be fantastic. Two amazing shows in a, th- a venue that I love, and then two amazing shows with Pearl Jam. And then seeing listeners, I'm seeing, like I said, I'm seeing Wayne, I'm trying to hook up with Jeremy, all these other people who are reaching out to me, and I and I, I would love to see them and hang out. Michael, I'm going with him, to because he reached out with a Pearl Jam ticket for me on Friday. Uh, it, it's just great. It's I, I love it. I'm so excited to go to Seattle. I hope if you're anywhere near there, you will come to a show. There's a Thursday show, there's a Saturday show. Uh, and like I said, any Patreon people, contact me, I'll work with you, and we'll figure out a way to get you in the door. We'll figure something, because it's tricky with me and Graham. But, uh... 
but man, I hope you'll come. I hope you'll come and see me in Seattle. I hope you'll come and see me in Toronto. And I hope you'll go look at the new MikeSchmidtComedy.com website. And I hope you'll understand that year 11 is going to be... I'm fucking excited, man. I'm really... I'm jacked. My I, The rebirth has begun, man. My apartment is beautiful. Oh, the new carpet. I didn't even tell you guys about that shit. Dude. So they were going to put in the fucking new carpet, right? And uh, that was... Uh, what, Thursday? Yeah, Thursday morning. So I recorded for you guys. And I'm like, yeah, they're coming in to do the carpet. Dudes, Thursday morning... Uh, you know, first of all, after I, I did my show last week, Pat showed up and we just moved my apartment. We moved a bunch of stuff out into the, uh, into the game room because I was supposed to, did I mention, I, I don't know what I talked about last week. I know I talked about direct TV, but we, I was going to get a truck, but I wanted to be using, putting my stuff in the game room. Anyway, I slept in the game room. I went out and drove after, after Pat helped me unload my whole apartment. Uh, I went out and drove because I needed to make some goddamn money. Cause again, I don't know if I mentioned to you, I waited too long to book stuff in Seattle and I am fucking boned. So, uh, I went and drove that night and it was, I got back and I, there was nothing in my apartment. So I went in the game room and I slept in a chair. I slept in the old trusty purple chair that Pat gave me that we dropped off a balcony once. And, uh, they were supposed to be there to paint at nine. So I set my alarm for eight 40. Well, at fucking eight 15, the manager comes in the game room and, and I wake up immediately and, she, and I pretend like I'm, I was awake the whole time. And she looks at me and she's like, Oh my God, you slept in here all night. And I go, well, not all night. I drove until about four, four thirty, And then I got in here. And she said, okay, well, he's waiting outside your apartment now. I said, I thought you said nine. She goes, no, he's there now. So I go over there. She wasn't kidding. She said, he's there now. So I go over to let in the carpet rolling team. Hi, Jose. One dude. One dude is here to do my fucking apartment. So I let him in, and uh, and he sees the carpet. And even he, this is Jose, a guy who does carpet for a living. He walks in, and he goes, oh, yes, oh, very bad. <laughs> I'm like, all right, great. So we walk in the apartment, me, him, and then Naomi comes to meet us from the game room and she walks right in my apartment. She goes, I smell gas. I said, yeah, I don't. She goes, no, no, I, I absolutely smell gas. And she says to Jose, do you smell gas? He goes, I, I, I don't. I, and she goes, do you smell gas? And he's like, I don't, I, I guess, yes, I don't. I, and she goes, do you speak like any English? Like how much English do you speak? He's like, eh, hey, little, but not there. So she looks at me and goes, no, I definitely smell gas. I go, okay, well, I don't. And the oven, all, all those are off. And she goes, no, it's coming from the furnace. I said, I haven't had the furnace on since fucking October. Not even October. It was too hot in October, December. And she just goes, no, it's, uh, you, you need to call emergency services right now from, from the, the gas. And I went, whoa, 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 come on. And, you know, I've only, I've had three and a half hours of fucking sleep. I didn't say this to her, but in my head, I'm telling you guys, I had three and a half hours of fucking sleep. I let Jose in to do my carpet. Finally, this is the home stretch. I moved the previous day all fucking day. Pat has painted my apartment. I'm just, I just want this shit done. And she's like, no, you need to call the gas company because we can't work in here because we smell gas. And I, part of me thinks it's this elaborate ruse, like she's pissed that they got to put in a carpet and this will be their final out. And I'm like, you've got to be. So I did. I said, fuck it, fine. So I called emergency services. I go, you know, we smell gas in my apartment. She goes, do you smell it? I go, my landlady does, my manager. So you guys, and so they sent a guy out and we had to wait like because they couldn't work on the carpet. We had to fucking wait. Guy shows up in 30 minutes to his credit. He doesn't smell any gas. He's like, no, man, the furnace is fine. It's got an automatic shutoff. There would be no gas. She's like, well, I smell it. And he goes, well, I smell a little bit. And I'm like, great. That's all we needed. So then they go in the kitchen. Now, my kitchen is packed like Tetris. I mean, there's a fucking TV and a TV stand and a bunch of boxes and everything's like an ironing board. Everything's all fucking stacked on top of one another because I needed to keep as much space as I possibly could. In the game room was just furniture. But in the fucking shower and the kitchen was all the other stuff, boxes and documents and fucking everything else and my desktop computer. And so he goes in the kitchen and he goes, yeah, I can smell it here by the stove. And I went, Ugh. so I, I, Naomi's like, we got to take all that stuff out of there. I go, man, I'm not taking all that stuff out of the kitchen. And he goes, well, I have to get to the stove. I go, I'll take some of it out. So I, by myself, I start lugging big boxes of books and Naomi's like, do you need any help? I'm like, what are you going to do? I didn't say that to her, but I was like, seriously, no, I said, I got it. And I cleared as, as little space as I possibly could where the guy could finally get at the stove. And he goes in and he looks at it and he goes, oh, your pilot light is out. I'm like, all right. I don't, I said, I don't use the stove. Or I, I said, I don't use the oven. He goes, no, no, the, the up top, the burners. I said, all right, well, I haven't cooked anything in two months, month and a half. And he's like, all right. And he just relays the pilot light. He goes, okay, we're done. And he leaves. I'm like, that was why I called emergency services. And there she's like, well, I, you can't work in here if I smell gas. Fine, fine, fine. And I, you're only being cautious. I get it. But still... I just want my fucking carpet done. So then I got to re-Tetris the goddamn kitchen. Jose immediately tackles the bedroom carpet, and he's just tearing it the fuck up. And I uh, I go, all right, are you cool? And he's like, yeah. And I go, do I have to stick around here? And he, go, and he goes, no. And I go, are more people coming? And he goes, no, it's just me. I go, just you? I go, when will you be done? And Naomi goes, I hope you're done around 5 o'clock. And he says, no. He goes, uh, 12, 12.30, 12.30, 1 o'clock. 
And she goes, really? That soon? And he goes, yeah. I go, do you have people coming to help you? He goes, no, it's okay. It's easy job. And I'm like, all right, dude. I go, where are your other people? And he goes, they're all on, uh, they, they're all on other jobs. I'm very lucky. I'm like, great. But in my head, I'm just like, but they sent, but you're the only fucking guy. And then granted, he's the main guy, I guess. But still, one dude is laying a fucking carpet. Are you kidding me? Fuck that. So I left. I went out driving. I drove all morning. I got back here at 1230. He was not done, but he was stacking. This motherfucker tore up carpet, tore up padding, stacked it all outside. And I came in right when he was done. At 1230, he was done with that. He had not laid any carpet yet, though, because he was busy sweeping the bedroom. And I'm, I'm telling you, folks, if you would have seen the dust, you know, you ever go to a fucking restaurant and they got that peanut shell sawdust shit on the floor? Okay. Imagine if that restaurant had been open for 20 years and never closed and never swept. He pulls up this carpet, dude. I mean, it was like, I, I, it was two inches, easily two inches of dust. And, and he's sweeping it up. I, mean, I say two inches, covering the entire apartment floor, not, not a pile that he swept up. He's sweeping up, and I see it. There's just clouds. And he's not wearing a mask, by the way. Jose did not wear a fucking mask to put in my carpet. Are you shitting me? But he didn't. So he, he fucking sweeps up, and I... And, I will tell you this, Pat was like, dude, you need to vacuum when they pull up this thing. He goes, you can't let them put a rug over whatever the fucking mess that they're going to have. I go, okay, because again, I'm not a man. I don't know this shit. So I looked at him and I go, hey, I'm going to vacuum out here while you're sweeping in the bedroom. He goes, okay, it's fine. And now I have a dirt devil. You know, I had a, I had a fucking vacuum and Pat's like, dude, trash this vacuum. It's not, it's not working. And I said, fine. I literally, anything Pat said, I did. So he goes, and he sent me a link, and he goes, you should order one of these two vacuums. Kyle has this one, and it's a good one. I mean, I, he's just, dude, he's my dad. He's totally fucking sherping me through this whole thing. So I ordered the Dirt Devil. It showed up. We put it together, and uh, and I, I, I plug it in, and I start to vacuum the floor, and I filmed it because it was so bad. I'll, I'll, I should put up the video on, on YouTube or on, on Facebook. I'm, I'm, it's like, you just hear the vacuum going, I'm I'm trying and just moving dust around and there's garbage and padding. And then all of a sudden you hear the vacuum go, and I just smelled burning. I I smelled burning. And I, so I turned the vacuum off. I only taped like 20 seconds of me vacuuming. Uh, and I, I just go, well, this, this, I, something happened. And I texted Pat. I go, dude, uh, it made a noise and it started to smell like burning. He goes, well, he goes, don't vacuum anymore. He goes, but I guarantee you it's fine. He, sometimes it'll chew up some padding. So I looked at Jose and I go, hey, look, man, I can't vacuum. I'm really sorry. You're going to have to sweep the living. And he goes, oh, it's okay. I would anyway. It's fine. So I leave again. I go drive some more. I get back at three o'clock in the afternoon and uh, and the piles of carpet and padding outside are gone. Jose's work van is gone. And that means my holy grail has been accomplished. And I go to my, my apartment and I open the door and uh, dudes, it's, it's just, it's just perfect. It's like, I know it sounds stupid again. It's not a house. Uh, but compared to what I had, it's perfect. The paint in the daytime, the blue and the green, and then the, the new carpet. And it's, it's, it's fuzzy, like it, it sinks under your feet. Like you can walk on it and it's soft and it's not like a not like walking on a wooden floor with handy wipes on it. I mean it was absolutely gorgeous. When I opened the door, it looks like hedgehog fur. It's like brown and white and it it is I felt like wistful. I got kinda, you know, choked up and and I because again, all the things that Pat has done for me and and then that day Pat was coming back over and Mike Siegel was coming over. They were gonna help me put my apartment back together. Uh I was astonished. And so I did a video, a little walkthrough. You can find that at the YouTube channel where I filmed the, the rug and the paint. And you can just see, you know, you see the kitchen, how stacked up it was. And, uh, you know, it was funny. Gio's like, you got to do a 10 minute tape where you're talking a 10 minute video where you talk about like your hopes and dreams for your new place and the rebirth. I go, dude, nobody's going to watch 10 minutes of me walking through one bedroom apartment. It's a house. Yeah. I said, but I'll, I'll try to capture what I can. And so I put up a video and, and it was, uh, it was, I think, did I go live? I might not have gone live. It might have just been a video that I posted. But you can find it at the YouTube channel. And uh, it was it was so great. It was just, it was Christmas. It was such Christmas. Such a weird feeling. So Pat was going to come over around 5. And uh, and I was by myself. And I'm like, well, fuck this. I mean, I, I wasn't going to wait for Pat. So I started, cause I, and also because I, I wanted to be, uh, <laughs> this will sound funny. I wanted him to be proud of me. I wanted him to be happy. So I went out and I started carrying my own things in from the game room. And when I say carrying in my own things, like I, I can carry in the bed frame, I can carry in the slats and, and stuff like that. But I also, like I threw the box spring on my back. I threw the mattress on my back. Uh, I threw a whole chair on my back. I brought that in. Uh, and I, I brought in everything except one, except for one chair and the couch. All the end tables, all the, I mean, everything that we had put out in the game room was in. 
And uh, by the time he got there at five, he comes in. He's like, all right, man, let's get this going. I go, dude, I brought everything in. And he's like, what? I go, yeah, I brought everything except the couch and a chair. And then Siegel showed up and uh, and Pat was touching up paint. He put in like new light bulbs. He And Siegel comes in and they're, we're bringing stuff in. We're arranging. Oh, Pat put together a desk. I told you he gave me a desk. It was just, it was so perfect. And just, you know what I loved? My friends. I loved seeing my friends. They they were in my cool house. And now with the cool house, I'm hoping I'll have more friends come over just to watch movies and hang out. I want to and just get a pizza with somebody and do this. I felt very domestic. It's funny. I reached out to Randy. I was like, hey, we can cook steaks and just like watch Netflix at my house or whatever. You know, and, and I know it sounds creepy, but I, I just I would love to start hanging out and start I start entertaining. My house is nice. It's not yet. I mean, I will tell you this. It still looks like a tornado went off because I haven't been able to sort anything because I started driving immediately Thursday night and then all weekend long to try to make a bunch of money. And then yesterday was Friday or yesterday was Monday, I should say. Um, but once I get the house where it's going to be, I'm going to start streaming you know, two, three times a week. And I'm just, I have such plans. I have such plans and I'm so proud and so happy that my friends helped me get here and, and and that you guys are following along. And it's, it's just going to be great. It's, I I couldn't tell you how happy I am. I mean, everything is taking shape. Uh, I told you I I lost eight pounds in July. I want to try to lose 10 pounds a month, but I lost eight, uh, which is fantastic. You know, I weigh myself on the first, I step on the scale on the first. So um, I'll weigh again on September 1st. But I went and lifted with John twice last week, twice this week. I'm going out of town. I'll try to walk a little in Seattle, maybe do some cardio. I don't think I'll lift while I'm there. But I mean, I just, everything, I just, I want to start cooking in my new house. Everything is renewed. Everything, everything is new. I'm, I'm so fucking happy. And, uh, and the apartment is painted and the, the rug. And when I get home from Seattle, so I'm going to Seattle now and this is going to be a blowout, man. I got two fucking great shows and then I got two shows of Pearl Jam. I get home Sunday and Sunday is a day where I do laundry and I sort and I have to throw things away. Now, I know you're thinking to yourself, well, Mike, didn't you throw things away before? Well, uh, yeah, I shredded 48 pounds of documents and I probably should have done a lot more because you know what? You know, it's a sobering moment for you when your friends start throwing your own things away without asking you. And I'm like, dudes, what are you doing? Uh... There is nothing funnier in the world than having people make fun of the things that you save. Because Siegel, and I, because I had, look, I've got these bins full of books, but I've also got DVDs. But also here, dudes, I've told you this before on the show. I've got four different bins filled with VCR tapes, and I don't know what's on them. Some of them I know. And I also found in there, there was a workbook where I actually started to document stuff. Like one, one videotape, there's six hours worth of stuff. It's a full notebook paper page of things that are on there. It's insane. It's insane. Uh, but the best part of it is Mike Siegel. Just whenever they saw the videotapes, they just both looked at me. They go, throw them out immediately. And I'm like, I can't. I want to save them someday to try to you know, digitize. And they're like, Jesus fucking Christ, this is just taking up space. And, uh, and so all day, Siegel just keeps reaching into the VCR tapes and pulls out. He just goes, Van Halen, live without a net. And just stares at me. And I would start laughing. He pulls out, this is, again, he pulls one out and it says, Simpsons, Simpsons, Simpsons galore. I'm like, well, yeah, we could probably throw that one out. He goes, yes, considering they have a station that's dedicated to the fucking Simpsons, yeah, you could throw that out. And meanwhile, Pat's putting together the desk. Siegel and I are moving. Siegel, he arranged my whole fucking kitchen. I mean, it was just, it was phenomenal. My friends were here helping and I loved it so much. But then they fucking reach in. He pulls out a tape and it just says, Academy Awards 2002. And I, that was the one. That that was the one that did, I started laughing so hard. I, I was crying. I was crying. Because I was like, yeah, you're going to keep this? you can go ahead and review the one? Okay.
you, Schmitty. You don't come to a throne if you're not gonna suck a dick. Heck.